present, the jurors are ready to be brought in. Are both sides ready to proceed? State ready, Your Honor. Defense? Yes? Yes? Okay. Jurors are entering. The jurors are present. You all may be seated. State, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Carol Pop. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. You can put your hand on and be seated. Please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. 
My name is Dr. Terrell Topps. My last name is spelled T as in Tango, O as in Oscar, P as in Paul, S as, as in Sam. Good morning, Dr. Topps. How are you? Good morning, sir. Um, what is uh, your occupation, Dr. Topps? I'm an associate medical examiner. And who do you work for? I work for the Palm Beach County Medical Examiner's Office. And how long have you been employed there? I'll be there for three years this September. Okay. Would you briefly tell us uh, about your education, sir? Yes. I graduated from undergrad at Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina. After I finished there, I went to, to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, for my great. Uh, for my post-baccalaureate training. After that, I went to the University of Rochester in upstate New York, where I got my medical degree. Uh, after I completed there, I was a uh, pathology resident at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And I completed my education in anatomic pathology at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. After I completed that, I did a fellowship in forensic pathology at Wake Forest University um, Hospital, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And after that, that's when I uh, joined the military, the United States Air Force. Okay, so we want to tell us about your uh, experience with the Air Force and uh, your employment experiences after you left the Air Force, please. Yes, yeah, so after I completed my forensic pathology uh, fellowship, I became a member of the United States Air Force where I was working for the Department of Defense where I performed autopsies on service members uh, who died in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and when those two campaigns were over, I also performed autopsies for the Department of Defense um, during the global war on terrorism. I did that for four years. Afterwards, I became a professor at the Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., where I taught pathology to medical students, nursing students, grad students, dental students, um, pathology. Uh, after I completed that, I worked briefly at the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C., Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Um, shortly afterwards, that's when I moved down to South Florida, uh, where I became a f associate uh, medical examiner at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office. Was there for almost three years, and then after that, I transferred and moved to Palm Beach County Medical Examiner's Office, where I'm at right now. Okay. And uh, are you licensed to practice medicine? Yes, I'm licensed to practice medicine in the state of Florida. Okay. And uh, any uh, board certifications? Yes, I'm board certified in anatomic pathology, which is a field where I understand um, natural causes of death. Uh, and then I was, I'm also board certified in forensic pathology, where I understand um, the non-natural manners of death, um, homicides, suicides, accidents, and um, sometimes undetermined cases, um, but also natural as well. Okay. And have you ever testified as an expert in forensic pathology? Yes. Uh, yes, I have. Approximately how many times, Dr. Tops? <sighs> Close to 100. In what courts? Uh, federal courts, um, county courts, um, also in military courts as well during my time in the military. Approximately... If you can give us an estimate, how many autopsies have you performed in your career? Oh, uh, well over a thousand. And in uh, those autopsies, Dr. Topps, how many uh, were uh, the result of gunshot wounds? Well, when I was in the military, there was a lot of those. Pretty much the majority of the cases were either ballistic injuries from IEDs, but I would say probably at least 150 cases that okay. are gunshot wound cases. Okay. I'd like to uh, call your attention to Thursday, February the 15th, 2018. Where were you working at that time? Uh, at the Brow County Medical Examiner's Office. Okay. And on that date, did you have an occasion to perform some autopsies? Yes. On uh, February the 15th. Okay. 
I want to show 2018. you. 2018. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 2018. I'm sorry. To, what did I say? Um, I think you said the 14th. I might be wrong. Oh, okay, 2018. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. All right. I want to show you now uh, States Exhibit 18Y, 18W, 18X, 18U, and 18V. Uh, Dr. Thompson, could you get enough, uh, to take a look at these, please, sir? Thank you. I looked at these and I recognize them. Okay, and I want to show you uh, states exhibit uh, mark 184 that's already been introduced into evidence. Yes, I recognize this picture. Okay, and who is that? Uh, Luke Hoyer. Okay, and did you perform an autopsy on Luke Hoyer? Yes, I did. Okay, and that was on uh, February the 15th, 2018, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, with those uh, exhibits, those photographs, Dr. Topps, help you in illustrating for the court and the jury the nature of Luke Hoyer's wounds. Yes. And when they uh, help you in uh, explaining to the court and to the jury uh, the cause of death of Luke Hoyer. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to offer those exhibits that were 18B, uh, 18U, 18X, 18W, 18Y. Is there any objection? Yes, we object for simply the MIL 12 and ask that we be able to incorporate all arguments contained therein, including um, case set authorities, state and federal constitutional principles. Thank you. Thank you. Your objection is noted. Over the defense objection, 18U will be received as 445, 18V like Victor, 446, 18W, 447. 18X, like X-ray, 448, 18Y, 449. Dr. Topps, uh, while the clerk is uh, marking those exhibits, uh, States Exhibit 84, that's Luke Hoyer that you performed the autopsy on, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, Your Honor, uh, Ian, do you know what that red line Let's is? Click on the X, Claire. Pardon? Click on the X, Claire. Uh, I don't have it on my screen. Click on the little three little arrows. Or three little arrows. Yeah. Okay. And then click on the X. Gotcha. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Topps, the uh, weight, height, and age of Luke Hoyer? The time of the autopsy? The weight um, at the time of the autopsy, Mr. Hoyer weighed 192 pounds. The height was uh, 5 feet and uh, 6 inches, which is 66 inches um, in height. And age? Age, uh, I believe he was 15. Okay. Dr. Tufts, I want to show you now. This exhibit marked 446. And you uh, explain to us what that shows. Yes, so 
This is showing the left side of Mr. Hoyer's uh, face and neck on the left side. Uh, there are actually three holes that are present on the left side of his neck. As you can see in the center of the photo, uh, there's a circle and there's a placard labeled A on a, um, that, that is an arbitrary letter that is signifying and pointing to the entry gunshot wound of the, just under the um, jaw, on the left side of the jaw. That's the entrance. As you go further down, down the neck towards the uh, collarbone, there is a, uh, another hole. That's an exit. And as it goes closer down to the, uh, the scale or the placard that's labeled A18-0526, there is another hole, which is a re-entry gunshot wound, where the bullet was able to uh, injure uh, Mr. Hoyer's neck on a superficial level, where portions of the bullet was able to be under the skin and resurfaces out of the skin and re-enters back into the skin of Mr. Hoyer to cause additional injury to the body, which um, you won't be able to see, but it's internally okay. involved what, in the what, chest. What were those injuries? So this, uh, once, as you can see, the hole where the re-entrance is right above that scale, uh, it went from the left side of the neck and it crossed over into the midline and went to the right side under the right collarbone. As it did that, it injured two major blood vessels uh, that supplies the head and brain. One is called the right common carotid artery, which is important for providing blood flow to the right side of the skin and to the right side of the brain. At the junction where that right common carotid artery is located, there's another blood vessel called the right brachiocephalic. Brachiocephalic um, artery supplies blood flow to the right arm and also to the face as well, the right side of the face. Those two blood vessels were severed, they were obliterated. The bullet continued traveling into, uh, now leaving the neck area, going into the right uh, chest cavity where the lung is located. And what was injured was the lung, and there are three lobes, uh, the right upper, the right middle, and the right lower. The right middle lobe was not injured, but the right upper and the right lower lobes were damaged. And as that occurred with the injury to the lungs and to those major blood vessels I mentioned to you at the neck, there was a significant amount of blood that was lost. And what happened was the um, blood had to go somewhere. The blood went into the right chest cavity where it was able to compress the lung. With that happening, uh, it led to over a, about a liter and a half of, of blood to be trapped in the right uh, chest cavity. But the bullet continued traveling and it ultimately exited out of the upper portion of the right side of his back. So that injury that you see where it went from under the uh, left, under the jawline of Mr. Hoyer's um, neck, went under the surface of the skin, exited, re-entered, crossed midline, injured the blood vessels involving the right side of his neck, the, uh, the right common carotid that supplies the blood flow to the face and to the inner side of the skull and the brain, and also the blood flow involving his right arm. Significant amount of bleeding. The bleeding went into his right chest cavity, started compressing his lungs, um, by basically drowning his and compressing his lungs, continue injuring the um, lobes of the lung, and then exited out of the back. So uh, that's a significant amount of blood, um, almost a liter and a half of blood, where blood should not be present in the right chest cavity. It's supposed to only be the lung, so that the lung can expand and contract upon breathing in and breathing out. 
So that was the gunshot wound at the neck. Okay, and was that uh, gunshot wound that you labeled A, was that fatal in and of itself? Absolutely. Okay, and uh, showing you State's Exhibit 445, Dr. Topps. Does that illustrate uh, the path that you described of the bullet going from top to bottom and, and re-entering? <coughs> yes, yes sir, and that's a probe that I was able to illustrate how the bullet uh, was able to pierce the skin, barrel under the skin, exit it out of the skin, re-enter it into the skin of the neck, and wreaked significant injury inside of the um, body, specifically involving the right side of the neck and the right side of the chest cavity. Okay. So the wound goes from top to bottom? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that wound consistent with him, uh, Luke Hoyer, being on the ground? Uh, that's one possibility, yes. What are the other possibilities? Uh, he could have been maybe falling in the process of being injured. He could have fallen down and was probably shot at while he was in the process of hitting the ground. Or he may have been kneeling. There's, there's all kinds of scenarios um, to explain this type of injury. Okay. But it went from top to bottom. The muzzle obviously was above, right? Uh, it would most likely be him and on the ground or about to hit the ground while the bullet from the muzzle of the weapon was able to shoot and injure Mr. Hoyer, Hoyer when he was below that weapon. Okay. And showing you now space exhibit mark uh, 447, Dr. Topps. Yes, so this is a uh, photo of showing the back side of Mr. Hoyer. That hole is where the uh, bullet was able to exit. Um, and as you can see, um, there's a little bit of blood um, that is on the outer edges. And you can see that the dark uh, red area is blood from the chest cavity, from the injuries from that of the lung tissue um, that was uh, damaged from the gunshot wound. Okay. And showing you now State's Exhibit 448. That's gunshot wound B? Yes. Uh, in this photo, uh, you can see the uh, left side of the hip where there is a hole, where there is a placard labeled B as in Bravo um, pointing to the hole. That is the gunshot wound of the torso. And what you see uh, on the surface is only just a telltale sign of what actually happened internally. So the bullet entered the left side of his hip uh, damage one of the major blood vessels called the uh, left femoral vein that supplies um, returning blood from the lower extremities of his, from the toes up to his um, thighs back to the heart. That was damaged. That resulted in significant um, bleeding as well. The bullet continued traveling where it injured his rectum and also injured portions of his small intestines. That's in his abdominal cavity. The bullet kept traveling and uh, injured and stopped after it fractured the um, front surface of the iliac bone, which is important to, it's a part of the pelvis that gives uh, the body the ability to hold up the abdominal organs and the organs that are in the chest. So the projectile was found there, and I was able to remove it and submit it as evidence to law enforcement. Okay. And showing you State's Exhibit 449. Is that what you were talking about, Doctor? Yes. This is what I was able to remove from Mr. Hoyer's um, um, pelvis which resulted in injuries that resulted in 150 milliliters of blood that was found in the abdominal cavity based on this injury. So this along with the other injury involving the neck 
and the torso um, involving the chest specifically resulted in almost 1.5 liters amount of blood that was lost internally. And uh, Dr. Tops, what was the cause of death of Blue Coy? The cause of death is gunshot wounds of neck and torso. Okay. Would Mr. Hoyer have been conscious after gunshot wound B? Yes, he would have been conscious. And this is that type of injury, he could have been saved if he was able to get medical assistance but, immediately. But not A. A is fatal. Tops. Did you have occasion to perform another autopsy on Aaron Feist? Aaron Feist, yes. I performed an autopsy on him on the same day. Okay. And now I'd like to show you State's Exhibit 19F, 19G, 19E, 19D, 19C, 19B, and State's Exhibit 104. So I'm going to show you a state's exhibit 104 that has already been introduced in evidence. And do you recognize that individual? Yes, sir, I do. And who is that? This is uh, Mr. Aaron Lewis uh, Bice. Okay. And showing you the, uh, these exhibits, you know, uh, Dr. Tops, that I just uh, read into the record. Could you take a look at those and see if you can identify them, sir? I recognize these. And what are they? These are photographs of Mr. Feist that I directed the my autopsy uh, assistants to photograph to identify the gunshot wound entry sites of two gunshot wounds involving that of the torso. Okay. And with these exhibits, these photographs, aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the nature of Aaron Feist's wound? Yes, sir. And would uh, these exhibits also uh, help you in explaining to the court and to the jury uh, the nature and cause of death of Aaron Place? Yes. Well, Your Honor, this time I'd like to offer uh, exhibits that I've read into the record, please, Your Honor. <coughs> Is there any objection? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. We have the briefs out of box. Sure.
a 10 minute recess. Please leave your notepads behind. Please do not discuss the case among one another. Uh, do not begin deliberating and we'll be back with you shortly. Do you need something? No. We're in recess. If you, we're going to take a 10-minute recess. Oh, okay. I don't know. Oh. You're just looking like you were waiting for something. I just waited to figure out what we were doing. I wasn't on the net. There was a little smudge on the, uh, okay. yeah. the picture. And Thank you. Jurors are present. Everyone may be seated. States 19B will be received as 450, 19C as in Charlie 451, 19E 452, 19F 453, and 19G 454. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, Dr. Tops, the uh, Height, weight, and age of um, Mr. Feist? The height of Mr. Feist is, at the time of the autopsy, was 68 inches. Uh, the weight was 376 pounds and the age 37. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm going to show you now State's Exhibit 450. It's been introduced in evidence. And can you, you describe that for us, sir? We can't see anything. Can you see it? No, ma'am. Your Honor, sorry. No, you're mandatory. Okay. Thank you. Yes, so in this photo, in the center of the photo, you see there is a gunshot wound that's located just in the region of the left armpit of Mr. Feiss. Uh, there's a placard labeled A as an alpha, which was arbitrarily assigned to the, um, the, the number for, or the letter of the injury to Mr. Feiss. Uh, along with a scale that's at the bottom of the photo labeled A18-0522 that is linked forever to Mr. Feiss um, with all the photos that you'll be seeing of him today. Uh, as you can see, there is a hole, and that's the gunshot wound entry site that injured the left chest, uh, left armpit area. And what damage, uh, Dr. Tops, did that Gunshot wound A cause. The uh, what protects the lungs are the ribs, and 
one of the ribs was fractured by the bullet. It was specifically the uh, left lateral fifth rib that was obliterated. The, there are two lobes of the left lung. The left upper and the left lower uh, lobes were also um, destroyed, which resulted in uh, the amount of uh, 600 milliliters or more than a half of a liter of blood um, in the left chest cavity. The bullet continued traveling and injured the eighth rib that's in, of the back. Uh, so two ribs were fractured. This was the second one. And the bullet then disintegrated and became um, um, fractured. The bullet was in the process of exiting the body, but because of the injuries that it inflicted on the uh, ribs, it disintegrated and stopped in the soft tissue in the mid region of the back at midline, where the fragments of the projectile was collected by me and submitted to law enforcement as evidence. Okay. Was that wound, wound gunshot wound A, fatal in and of itself? Yes. Okay. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 451. Is that a uh, perspective shot of the gunshot wound to uh, his armpit? Yes, this is where um, Mr. Feiss's arm is lifted um, above his head, and you can see a, a better perspective of the injury of that gunshot wound entry site. And uh, the damage that it inflicted, as I mentioned to you earlier, the ribs and also the upper and lower lobes of the left lung that resulted in significant uh, bleeding inside of his left chest cavity that as well as the other victim, as I mentioned before, um, internal bleeding resulted in the compression of the left lung, making it very difficult for him to breathe and maintain um, his ability to receive oxygen for not just um, that his lungs, but his brain and the rest of his body. Okay. And uh, Dr. Topps now states exhibit 452. This is a photo where you can see uh, this is the showing the chest, the left side of the chest of Mr. Feist. At the very top, mm -hmm. around 1 o'clock in this photo, you see the um, gunshot wound that I previously described involving the left armpit. But as you look further down at the 6 o'clock position of this photo, where you see the scale uh, of A18-0522, that's associated with Mr. Fies, that's the second gunshot wound of the torso. And that is the entry site on the left side, the far left side of his um, lower um, chest. And what damage uh, did you, that's gunshot wound B, correct? Yes, B as in Bravo. Okay, and what damage did gunshot wound B cause? So uh, that injured the uh, rib cage again, fractured the eighth rib on the uh, left anterior lateral side of the rib cage. As the bullet uh, obliterated that bone, it continued traveling into the abdominal cavity where it injured the largest organ in the abdominal cavity called the liver, the left lobe of the liver, just obliterated that. Uh, continued traveling, damaging the stomach and uh, obliterated a portion of the pancreas, which is important for digesting food particles in the intestines. And then it continued traveling and had a devastating effect on the right kidney, which is highly vascularized, where there was significant amount of bleeding, massive bleeding from that. And it, those injuries resulted in 700 milliliters of blood. And um, based on the injuries of the organs, as I mentioned to you earlier, the bullet no longer had any um, um, power to continue traveling and it stopped right in the soft tissue um, just on the back portion of the right kidney. So a uh, significant amount of bleeding, more that than what was in the chest that was also um, noted in his internal bleeding. Okay. And would uh, gunshot wound B, Dr. Topps, be fatal in and of itself? Yes, based on the organs that were injured, it's, it's fatal. Okay, and 
So the cause of death of Aaron Feist was what? Gunshot wounds of torso. Okay. And showing you now State's Exhibit Mark 453. This is a photo of the projectile uh, that was retrieved from the um, back side of the right kidney that I was able to collect um, for law enforcement as evidence. Okay, and Stace Exhibit 454. These, this photo is showing that there are three fragments of the projectile. As I mentioned to you before, uh, this projectile disintegrated after it injured um, two ribs and damaged uh, his left lung. And this was found in the uh, mid portion of the back at midline that I was able to collect. That was in the soft tissue under the skin of Mr. Feis. Okay. Okay. Dr. Tox, there come a time on Thursday, February the 15th, 2018, that you performed a, a third autopsy. Uh, yes, okay. a third I'm autopsy. I'm showing you now State's Exhibit 113. Do you recognize that person? Yes, I recognize this person. This okay. is uh, Joaquin Oliver. Um, I may miss pronunciate the last name, Padaui or Padaway? Padoy, okay. Padaway. Yeah, we call him Joaquin Oliver, so that's fine. That's Thank who you. that is? Okay. Yes. Now I want to show you uh, Dr. Topps, 19J, 19T, 19U, 19S, 19M, 19L, 19K, 19R, 19Q, 19N, 19P and 19O. Dr. Tops, if you would take a look at these exhibits, please, and uh, let me know if uh, you recognize them. I recognize these photos. Okay. And what are they? These are photos of Joaquin Oliver. Um, he has sustained multiple gunshot wounds okay. throughout the body. Okay. And would uh, these photographs uh, assist you and, ex and aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the nature of Joaquin Oliver's uh, injuries? Yes, sir. And would these uh, exhibits uh, aid you and assist you in explaining to the court and the jury the manner of the death of Joaquin Oliver. Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, uh, 
These exhibits are the ones I'd like to introduce. 19P, 19O, 19N, 19Q, 19R, 19K, 19L, 19M, 19S, 19U, and 19T. Defense, is there any objection? Yes, we object pursuant to DMIL 12 and request to be able to incorporate all arguments and authorities therein. And we we'll just place particular emphasis on 19K as in Kilo, L as in Lima, and M as in Mike. Thank you. All right, over the defense objection. 19K will be received as 455. 19L will be received as 456, 19M, 457, 19N, 458, 19O, 459, 19P, 460, 19Q, 461, 19R, 462, 19S, 463, 19T, 464 and 19U, Dr. Uh, Tops, while the clerk is uh, marking those exhibits, uh, could you give us the height, weight, and age of uh, Joaquim Oliver? The height was 71 inches. The weight was 134 pounds. The age, 17 years old. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Dr. Tops, if it's okay with you, I'd like to start um, with uh, gunshot wound D first, if that's okay. And that's um, space exhibit mark 461. Is that coming up on the screen, your screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is a photo of Mr. Oliver's right palm. And in the center of the photo is the gunshot wound entry site uh, in the center of his right palm, which I'm illustrating with my palm right here in the center. Okay. And uh, is that described as a defensive wound? That's a possibility. Uh, it's I'm using my hand right hand as, a, as an example where if I'm trying to protect myself from being injured, it's just a reflex or um, primitive um, reaction to ward off any kind of injury. Um, in this case, of being injured with a firearm. And showing you uh, space exhibit 462. So this is the exit side of Mr. Oliver's uh, right hand. And it's in between, I'm using my right hand as an example. It's, uh, so it entered in the center portion of the palm of the right hand, exited out on the back side between the web of the index finger and the thumb. But before the exit wound was created, it damaged the bone called the uh, metacarpal bone of the index finger, and it caused it to shatter. So when the bullet entered into the palm, fractured that bone of the metacarpal bone, it led to a gaping exit wound where not only did the bullet leave, out of the hand, but also fragments of bone with it. Okay. And uh, gunshot wound C5 uh, states exhibit 458. This is a photograph of Mr. Oliver's left arm. There are two holes. One that is uh, towards the uh, four o'clock position of the photo, there's a round circular uh, defect. That's the gunshot wound entry site. And then there is a larger defect, a larger circle that is going upward towards the shoulder. Uh, the, that is actually the exit. And so the smaller defect is the entry wound at the four o'clock position. It entered and only damaged the soft tissue which is the muscle and the subcutaneous tissue of Mr. Oliver's left arm and exited out in the front towards the upper portion of the arm near the shoulder and exited. And no bone was injured or no major blood vessels were damaged. Okay. And showing you uh, Stace Exhibit um, Mark 459. This is showing a photo of the gunshot wound entry site of Mr. Oliver's left leg. So what we're looking at is uh, the side of the front portion of the leg where the great toe is located. So it's like the inner portion of the front of his leg. Okay, and the state's exhibit mark 460. This is showing the large gaping exit wound of what I showed you earlier that was the entry site. This is going further down towards the, um, the, the, the ankles to the feet. So it's going front to back and downward. And this large gaping exit wound, uh, what you see there is uh, the subcutaneous tissue and deeper in that defect is the muscle of the leg. The bullet uh, traveled between the two major bones that help us to stand upright, which is the tibia and fibula. It 
only injure the soft tissue and any um, nerves, blood vessels that may be present in between those two major bones. But the bones themselves were not injured. Okay. Now I'll show you State's Exhibit 455. Four fifty five exhibit four. Yes. So this is the side view of Mr. Oliver's head. And what you see above his left ear in the temple region of the head is a irregular gunshot wound. It's relatively large compared to the entry gunshot wounds that I explained to you before. Surrounding that... Doctor, you can use, uh, tell us what any color you want to illustrate and if you uh, think that would help. Yes, yeah, so at the, um, the one o'clock position in the upper portion of the photo, I don't know if I can manipulate yeah, it on my screen. Yeah, you can just use any color and uh, Ian will show you how to do it. Silicon pencil. Okay. So right here, I'm using um, the screen to show you that is the entry uh, gun shot wound site. It's irregular, meaning that it's larger than what a typical gun shot wound is able to cause in terms of damage. What's also important is that you have to look at these other defects that are surrounding a good portion of this gunshot wound. You see that there are these satellite areas of round punctate lacerations that are superficial. And based on my expertise as a medical examiner, I've been doing this for 15 years, these are what we call um, these defects other than the gunshot wound site, pseudostippling. What that means is, is that uh, there, the bullet likely injured an object before the bullet re-entered or entered the head of Mr. Oliver. And so when I described to you earlier the fragments involving Mr. Ol uh, Joaquin Oliver's hand, the bullet entered the palm, fractured the metacarpal bone. Not only did the bullet exit out of that hand, but also fragments of the bone of Mr. Oliver's right hand. It traveled in a direction. So if I can use my body as an example, here's my right hand, gunshot wound, entered here, exited here, fractured the metacarpal bone. The bullet continued traveling, hit me in the head in the left temple region, and the fragments of bone that was traveling with the bullet caused what we call pseudostippling with the laceration of the scalp. So he was like in this orientation, trying to protect himself from being harmed. Okay, I want to show you now. Stacy did it marked uh, 457. This is showing you the back of Mr. Oliver's head behind his right ear. And what you see, oh, I can use this um, marker to show you the jury. What we have here in this photo at six o'clock is, that's a portion of the, the exit wound of the bullet entering the left temple and exited behind the right ear um, near the upper portion of the neck. You see other defects on this photo. You see this small little laceration here that's near the center of this photo that's above his right ear. And also there's another defect which is a laceration that's on the side in the further the back of the head where the exit wound is located, those fractures are not caused specifically by the bullet exiting. It's actually the shattering of the skull. So when the bullet entered his left temple, 
the bullet had so much force that it basically caused an explosion inside of the skull and it caused it to fragment it so much and such a great effect that it was like a cherry bomb that was inside of one's head and it just caused the skull to explode and the brain with it. The projectile fragmented in many um, fragments, which is called a lead storm, if one looks at it under x-ray. And with the photos that you see here, um, unfortunately, Mr. Oliver's head was only kept together by a scalp and forehead. Everything under the skin was obliterated and the brain itself was morselated and was unrecognizable once I removed it. Okay. I'm showing you Stacey Exhibit 456. This is showing the, as you can see, the malformation of the head. It's not normal. Uh, there is on this photo behind the right ear at three o'clock of this photo, you can see that this is the exit wound here. And as you can see at nine o'clock in this photo, there's a long uh, linear laceration in which the skull was in the process of escaping, but it didn't because the scalp was able to keep the contents of the head from, of the skull to leave the, the scalp of Mr. Uh, Oliver's head. So uh, again, it's what we called in the field that I work in eggshell fractures, where it was just devastating obliteration and destruction of Mr. Oliver's skull and brain. Okay, showing you now Dr. Topps 465. This is showing the x-ray of Mr. Oliver and as you can see at 12 o'clock the head that it is fractured significantly. Uh, again, what is holding the head together is the skin of his forehead and his scalp. And you can see that there are fragments of projectile that when it entered into the inner table of the skull, that it disintegrated and led to what is called a lead storm. Okay, and 464. What is, this is showing, it's going to be difficult, difficult to see it, but I'm going to explain it to you. So this is a full body image of Mr. Oliver, and what you can see here at 3 o'clock of this full body x-ray, right around here, that is showing the left humerus, the bone of the arm. The humerus is fine, but what you see is that when you're able to look at a x-ray image, black is what is considered, and this square that I just put on the screen is going to be black. Anything that is dense, like bone or metal, like what we see here at 8 o'clock, um, Mr. Oliver had a phone. You can see the um, intricate um, engineering of that bone that he has, part of it's metal. If it's metal, that means it's radio dense. So when you look at the body of Mr. Oliver, you're going to have shades of gray, black, white. White is very dense bone or metal or enamel involving his teeth. White, that's what it is, radio dense. Black, it's air. So what you see here in the circle at 3 o'clock, you see the left arm, and there are pockets of air, which I'm covering the pockets of air with the arrow, and with that vertical line, 
that is showing you that the projectile entered his left arm and introduced air into his left arm, missing that of the humerus. But this in of itself wouldn't cause death, but it also bled, which contributed to the overall blood loss of Mr. Oliver. Okay, and showing you stage exhibit 463. This is showing fragments that I was able to collect from Mr. Oliver's brain. There were so many minute fragments, I wasn't able to get all of them. These were the representative fragments that I was able to retrieve as evidence. And this was collected from the, um, within the skull that was found throughout the brain tissue of the destructive nature of this bullet having an effect on the brain. And the cause of death, Dr. Topps of Joaquin Oliver? Multiple gunshot wounds. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, at this time I have no further questions of uh, Dr. Topps. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Your Honor, the next witness is going to be uh, kind of lengthy. Do you want to take a uh, lunch break now, or it's up to you? Um, like an hour, even? Yeah. Since we got a late start, we'll just go through with the next witness to see if Mrs. Jurors are shaking their head yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we would prefer to go to the next witness. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Ron Fairfield. Morning. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. You can go ahead and be seated. And when you're seated, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Ronald Faircloth. Last name is F A I R C L O T H. And uh, what is your occupation, sir? I'm a detective with the Broward County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And how long have you been in law enforcement? About 17 years. And how long have you been with the uh, sheriff's office? Uh, the entire time. Okay. And do you have any special responsibilities at this time? Yes, I've been doing digital forensics for approximately nine years. Okay. Could you please e explain uh, what that is to the jury? Yes. So uh, primarily my role is to take electronic devices, mostly cell phones, and I extract the data off of those phones 
take the extracted data and present it into a readable format for the investigators that are investigating the case to review. Okay. And what uh, is your training in order to enable you to do that? So I've been through, I've completed over a thousand hours in training for computer forensics, both Windows, Mac, cell phone forensics. Uh, I've been teaching digital forensics for about four and a half years uh, for a company called Cellbrite that's a, a manufacturer, a tool and software that we utilize in digital forensics. Uh, as an instructor, I've taught over 2,000 hours to hundreds of other forensic examiners across the globe. And do you keep up with specialized training? Yes. What, like, for instance? I've been through, so the first training class that I attended was a two-week course in Orlando put on by IASIS, the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists. It was a two-week program based on basic computer forensic training, and that was followed up by a six-month certification process. During the six-month certification process, I was required to examine numerous different hard drives and artifacts and complete questions and an examination to to finally get the certification. Okay. In a, and uh, have you uh, testified as an expert in cell phone forensics? Yes, I have. I've testified as an expert five times, three of which in state court and twice in federal court. Okay. So let me show you now state's exhibit. Four twenty nine that has been introduced in evidence, Detective Fairclough, that has been identified as a phone found in the east stairwell of the 1200 building on February the 14th, 2018. I'm you if you can identify that. Yes, sir. Okay. And what what is that? This is a ZTE Z818L cell phone that I examined on February 15th. Okay. And who did you, who did you obtain that cell phone from? I obtained it from Detective Valerian Perez. Okay. And so when you received uh, that cell phone, what did you do? When I received the cell phone, I first initially uh, did a physical examination of the phone. I checked it to determine if there was any, since it's an, an Android-based phone, if there were any SIM cards or micro SD cards in it. There was a SIM card in the phone. A SIM card is a small plastic chip that has copper com contacts on one side of it that's used to allow the phone carrier, uh, AT&T or T-Mobile like that, to authenticate the phone user so that they can make and receive calls, use data, make text messages. So after examining it, I found the SIM card. I pulled the SIM card out of the device, and then I began uh, to do the examination on both the SIM card and the cell phone. Okay, and explain the process to us. So the process involves two separate examinations. We examine the, each item individually. So I used what we refer to as a UFED uh, Touch 2. It's, it's a hardware device created by Cellbrite, the company I had mentioned earlier. UFED stands for Universal for, uh, Forensic Extraction Device. And it's basically a small tablet-based system that can process both the SIM card and the cell phone. So I initially started with the, cell phone, with the SIM card. I placed the SIM card into the proper location on the UFED Touch 2, at which time it extracted the data off of the SIM card. Uh, and it, when, I, when I say extraction, I'm referring to just basically the copying of data there's a number of different types of extractions that we can do. On SIM cards, the extraction type that we conduct is referred to as a logical extraction. It basically just reads live data off of, the, off of that SIM card. So it gets typically authentication information that the carrier needs to authenticate the user on their network. So once I completed that logical extraction, I then powered on the cell phone to determine if it was in a locked state. It was in a locked state with a swipe code. So I utilized a method 
that is referred to as EDL mode, which stands for Emergency Download Mode. It is a built-in process for Qualcomm processors. If you're not familiar with what a processor is, you've probably heard of Intel. Intel is a processor for computers. Qualcomm is basically a processor for cell phones. A processor is more or less the brains of the electronic device. It's what does all the processing. It does all the computations. So the Qualcomm processors have a built-in function in case of failure on the device where you can place them into this emergency download mode that allows you to recover the phone. So I placed the phone into emergency download mode, which allowed me to obtain a physical extraction of the phone. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have a few different types of extraction methods and types. So the SIM card, I conducted a logical extraction. On the phone, I conducted a physical extraction. A physical extraction is basically an exact copy of what's in the memory chip on the phone. So it starts at the beginning of that memory chip and it goes all the way down to the end of that memory chip and it gets everything in between. Okay, and we able to get uh, the telephone number? Uh, yes, we have the cell phone. The cell phone number on the device was 954-821-1007. Okay, and let me show you now space exhibit marked uh, 24T for identification. I detected here both in that. Yes, sir. What is that? This is exhibits from the cell phone report that I created. Okay, and what does it show? It shows two Gmail accounts that were that were logged in on the phone. There was a Gmail account for Linda Cruz 1949 at gmail.com, and there was a second email address of Nicholas Jacob Cruz at gmail.com as well. Okay. And that was in you got that as the basis of the physical extraction? Yes. Okay. And showing you now states exhibit uh, marked uh, 24U. Thank you. Thank you. What is that? This is the Stoneman Douglas uh, Bell schedule. All right. And how did you obtain that? This was, there was a PDF version of this bell schedule on the cell phone that I found. It had been downloaded on February 2nd, so approximately 12 days before the shooting. All right. How, how do you make that, how do you get that? So in examining the, the cell phone, the, the extraction that we pull off of the device, we open it into forensic software that basically translates the data. So the extraction isn't something that we can readily read. So in the process, we open it in this forensic tool that then translates it into something that we can recognize. So in doing so, I then go through the files on the device. I went through a number of different types of files that led me to this bell schedule. And it tells you exactly when it was downloaded? The, yeah, there is a creation date for that file. And what was the date again? It was, February 2nd, I'll give you the exact time. It was February 2nd, 2018 at 10, 12, and 21 seconds in the morning. Okay. So somebody downloaded that bell schedule? Yes. Okay. At, on February 2nd at 10, 21? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I want to offer a statement to the 24T and 24U. Is there an objection? This has been renewed all objections from DMIL 10 and also have rules 401 and 403. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over the defense objection states 24T will be received as 466, 24U, 467. Show you, Detective uh, Faircloth, State's Exhibit um, 467. Is that the bell schedule you got from the phone? Yes, sir. Okay. 
and I want to show you now Stace Exhibit Mark 24R. Yes, these are search history uh, excerpts from the search history on the phone that I created. Okay, and uh, you made that list yourself from the, yes, sir. the physical extraction from uh, 954-1007, uh, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer Stacey to the 24 <clears throat> Is there any objection? Yes, ma'am. Just to give the arguments and the authorities of DMIL 10, please. <coughs> okay, over the defense objection, 24R will be received as 468. Can you read that okay, or is it blurry? Yes, sir. I can read it. Okay, so tell us what this is. So, on a cell phone device, you can conduct searches through the internet, through different applications. This is excerpts from those searches that were found on the device. Okay. So would you run through it with this? Uh, you have ID1. Sure. ID1 was a search that was conducted on November 14th, 2017 at 649 and 21 seconds at night that says shooting people mass cure. Okay. Two. On... November 14th, 2017, at 6.53 and 27 seconds at night, a search for shooting people massacre. Okay. Then on February 9th, 2018, at 9.17 and 41 seconds in the morning, best AR-15 sites. On February 10th, 2018, at 11.48 and 14 seconds in the morning, Dollar Tree, Parkland, Florida, at two t on February 10th, 2018, at 12.36 and 27 seconds in the afternoon, cool cast designs. Then again, February 10th, 2018, 12.36 and 32 seconds in the afternoon, cool cast designs. And once again, February 10th, 2018, 12.50 and 6 seconds in the afternoon, cool cast designs. On February 10th, 2018, 646 and 32 seconds at night, school shooters. February 10th, 2018, 1128, 46 seconds at night, AR-15. February 10th, 2018, 1128 and 56, uh, 52 seconds at night, AR-15. February 11th, 2018, 1020, 10 seconds in the morning, AR-15. February 11th, 2018, 1045 and 14 seconds in the morning, AR-15. February 11th, 2018, 1045 and 32 seconds in the morning, AR-15. February 11th, 2018, 1045, 33 seconds in the morning, AR-15. And once again, February 11th, 2018, 1045 and 38 seconds in the morning, AR-15. Then on February 12th, 2018, at 1239 and 59 seconds in the afternoon, school shooters. On February 12th, 2018, at 1240 and 4 seconds in the afternoon, school shooters. Then on February 12th, 2018, 12.40 and 22 seconds in the afternoon, school shooter YouTube. On February 12th, 2018, 12.51 and 47 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree, Parkland, Florida. February 12th, 2018, 
at 119 and 5 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree, Parkland, Florida. February 12, 2018, 657 and 27 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree, Parkland, Florida. And on February 12, 2018, at 725 and 51 seconds at night, how long does it take for a cop to show up at a school shooting? On February 13th, 2018, at 10621 at night, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Again, February 13th, 2018, at 1010 and 54 seconds at night, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. On February 14th, 2018, at 918 and 45 seconds in the morning, Parkland, Florida, Dollar Tree. And the last one is February 14th, 2018, 1243, 20 seconds in the afternoon, Parkland, Florida, Dollar Tree. Okay. And now I want to show you Stacy's a bit more 24P. You take the fair call and see if you can identify that, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. This, this is web history from the device that uh, excerpts from those web history okay. items. And did you extract that? Did you do a physical extraction from 954, uh, 821, 107? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> How is it different from uh, what we just went over, the phone search history? So <clears throat> the searches are, are the terms themselves that might be searched. The web history would be, it could be as a result of a search where you type in a search for a term and then you get web results for that. And it would actually contain the URL, that, that link that displayed the data. It could also be links that you follow. Maybe you didn't do a search, but as you're on Google and you're accessing Google's website and you're clicking on different links and then you're following other links, all that data gets stored on the device as the web history. Okay. And you did the physical extraction yourself, and that's what you got from the, yes, sir. the phone 954-821-107, correct? Yes, sir. All right. This time I'd like to over to State's Exhibit 24P. You're welcome. Is there any objection? I'll again with objections in DMIL 10 as well as rules 401 and 403. Thank you. Right. Over the defense objection states 24P will be received as Show you state unit 469. <coughs> okay, can you tell us what this is? Yes, this is the excerpts from the web history. All right, so <coughs> what does it show? So it shows that. On February 10th, 2018, at 6.46 and 32 seconds at night, a Google search was conducted for school shooters, and you can see the URL that was generated. And then on February 10th, 2018, at 6.46 and 46 seconds at night, a, a link was followed to school shooting Wikipedia, so on the Wikipedia's website, for school shooting. On February 10th, 2018, at 6.47 and 14 seconds at night, Marshall County High School shooting Wikipedia. That Marshall County High School is a school shooting that happened January of 2018, in which two people were killed by a suspect of the name Gabe Parker in Benton, Kentucky. Then Back to school shooting on February 10th, 2018 at 6.48 and 44 seconds on the Wikipedia page. And then following an additional link on February 10th, 2018, 6.48, 52 seconds at night, 
for Red Lake Senior High School Wikipedia. At Red Lake, Minnesota, there was a school shooting in 2005 where the suspect, Jeff Weiss, shot and killed nine people. Again, on February 10th, 2018, 6.51 and two seconds at night, Red Lake Senior High School, Wikipedia. Then on February 10th, 2018, at 11.28 and 46 seconds, a Google search was conducted for AR-15. Then on February 10th, 2018, at 11.28 and 52 seconds, the tab at the top for videos, when you do a Google search, you get all videos, shopping, images, you can choose a selection from the top. They, he selected uh, the videos for AR-15. Then on February 11th, 2018, at 1020 and 10 seconds in the morning, still at the AR-15 videos Google search. On February 11th, 2018, 10, 20, and 25 seconds in the morning on the Rolling Stones website, how the AR-15 became mass shooter's weapon of choice, Rolling Stone. On February 11th, 2018, at 1045 and 14 seconds in the morning, the AR-15 Google search, again, on the videos tab. On February 11th, 2018, at 1045 and 32 seconds in the morning, AR-15 Google search, still on the videos tab. On February 11th, 2018, at 1045 and 33 seconds, AR-15, now back to the original link. Okay. Continuing on. February 11th, 2018, 10.45 and 38 seconds in the morning, the AR-15 Google search goes back to the videos link. Then February 11th, 2018, at 1.45 and 39 seconds in the afternoon, a YouTube search for Virginia Tech Massacre was conducted. Virginia Tech Massacre was a mass shooting that occurred in 2000 and 2007 where 32 people were shot and killed. Then again, on February 11th, 2018, at 145 and 44 seconds in the afternoon, the Virginia Tech massacre on YouTube. On February 11th, 2018, at 2, 12, and 9 seconds in the afternoon, Columbine Diary YouTube search Columbine was a school shooting that occurred in 1999 where 13 people were shot and killed. Then again, February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 46 seconds in the afternoon. Oh, sorry. Go back up to 18. February 18th, 2018, at 2.12 and 16 seconds in the afternoon, the Columbine Diary YouTube search again. Then as we come down to 19, you'll see February 11th, 2018, at 2, 12, and 16 seconds in the afternoon. This was a video on YouTube that was actually accessed. The title of the video is The Columbine Killers, Mass School Shooting, Crime Documentary, English Part 2. And again, on February 11th, 2018, at 2, 13, 46 seconds in the afternoon, that same video the Columbine Killers Mass School Shooting Crime Documentary, English Part 2. February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 46 seconds, the search for Virginia Tech Massacre on YouTube. Then again, February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 48 seconds in the afternoon, Virginia, T Virginia Tech Massacre. On February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 51 seconds, Virginia Tech Massacre, search on YouTube. February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 55 seconds in the afternoon, Virginia Tech Massacre on YouTube again. Then on February 11th, 2018, at 2.13 and 55 seconds, 
a YouTube video was accessed. <coughs> the title of that YouTube video was Virginia Tech Massacre YouTube. On February 11th, 2018, at 9.51 and 13 seconds at night, a search was conducted for AR-15 Close Quarter Combat YouTube. Again, on February 11th, 2018, at 9.51 and 18 seconds, AR-15 Close Quarter Combat search conducted on YouTube. February 11th, 2018, at 9.51 and 18 seconds at night, AR-15 close quarters basic gunfighting drills on YouTube, and this was an actual video that was accessed. And that same video was again accessed February 11th, 2018, 9.52 and 53 seconds, titled AR-15 close quarters basic gunfighting drills on YouTube. On February 11th, 2018, at 1031 and 34 seconds at night, a search was conducted on YouTube for school shooter footage. Again, on February 11th, 2018, 1031, 46 seconds at night, school shooter footage on YouTube. On February 11th, 2018, at 1031 and 46 seconds at night, a YouTube video was accessed with the title Body Cam Footage of Cop Shooting Armed Student on Campus. And again, on February 11th, 2018, at 1035 and 51 seconds at night, that same video, Body Cam Footage of Cop Shooting Armed Student on Campus. Then on February 11th, 2018, at 1117 and six seconds at night, a video was accessed with the title U.S. Army Make School Shooting Sim Simulator for Saving Lives on YouTube. Again, February 11th, 2018, at 1119 and 21 seconds at night, that same video, U.S. Army Make School Shooting Simulator for Saving Lives. Then on February 11th, 2018, at 1119 and 36 seconds at night, a YouTube video of Pumped Up Kicks by Abracadabra, Arm A2 edition on YouTube. Pumped Up Kicks is a song that refers to school shootings. It's a popular pop rock song. The lyrics to the chorus are all the other kids with the pumped up kicks, you better run, better run, outrun my gun. All the other kids with the pump. Let's go on to the next uh, next item. Uh, Detective Fair please. Mr. Satz, uh, there are a few people that need a break, so we're going to um, go ahead and take a break. If you all please leave your notebooks on your seats. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not begin deliberating or have any discussion whatsoever. I'm going to speak with the lawyers uh, once you're excused to, to determine whether or not this is a good time for a lunch break or whether we should finish this witness. Um, before the lunch break. So just be ready for an, another instruction from the bailiff, but for now, you're excused uh, temporarily.
jurors have been excused, the bailiff passed me a note that a number of them needed to use the restroom, okay. which is why I uh, interrupted you. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't know what your presentation is going to be, but do you think it would be better to let them break for lunch or bring them back when they use the restroom and finish the quick? Well, it's at least another hour. So I guess a lunch break wouldn't be bad. Is that okay with you all? Yes. All right. And then how many more witnesses do you have? Uh, two. So we'll be able to finish those witnesses oh, today. Oh, no, wait. No, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's, there's two, and then there's um, potentially seven victim impact. That might may or may not go today. Correct. And we have them here and available. Sure. No problem. Okay. I just didn't know if... Um, I wasn't sure exactly what your presentation was planned. So why don't we go ahead and recess? I'll, I'll have the bailiff excuse the jurors until um, one forty-five. with a plan that will start back at 2 o'clock. Thank you. I'm sorry if this uh, is the in your schedule, but please, um, you, you can be excused for the lunch break, but I'm sure you know the drill. Don't, please don't discuss the testimony with anyone during the break. Um, other than that, you can enjoy your break like everyone else, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. So I'll see you all back here at uh, 145. The jurors are ready to be brought in. Are both sides ready to proceed? Yeah, just one thing, Your Honor. Sure. Uh, you know, we had, to, because of that smudge, we put a piece of paper in. Okay. And uh, I'll show it to Mr. Stukor. Okay. We, we made a, a glossy, so. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Okay. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll so. So you're just substituting the paper version for the glossy yeah. photo paper version. Right. Okay. I guess I shouldn't even say glossy. For the photo paper, the, the copy paper version for the photo paper version. Which is 19B as 450. No, we're just working on this part. She's on here with that. Okay, thank you. And just before she gets to the judge, I just, um, for my last objection, I did admit the D number on the record of our arguments against judicial notice for the songs. The you didn't place the D number, our D number with, that has our arguments okay. against judicial notice, which sure. is DMIL9. DMIL9. Yes, just wanted to incorporate those. Arguments. Okay, thank you. And state, is your witness in here? Thank you. But we're waiting for now. She's back. Okay. Jurors are entering. Everyone else may be seated and state you may continue when you're ready. Uh, Ian, the, uh, my screen isn't working. I think you stopped at uh, 29, is that right, uh, Detective Shurkloff? Mm, sounds about right, yes. It looks blurry. Pardon? Is it blurry to you? Uh, a little on the right-hand side. Oh, 36, yes, we're at pumped up kicks. Is that better? I'm not the one reading it, so... <laughs> yeah, I can read it, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Going on to 37, it was February 12th, 2018, at 6.25, 38 seconds in the morning. Again, this was a YouTube video that was accessed, entitled Pumped Up Kicks, Abracadabra. Okay. And... Again, February 12th, 2018, 625, 42 seconds in the morning. YouTube video accessed with the title Pumped Up Kicks Abracadabra. On February 12th, 2018, 626 and 9 seconds in the morning. The YouTube video again was accessed, Pumped Up Kicks Abracadabra. On February 12th, 2018, at 12, 39, and 59 seconds, there was a Google search conducted for school shooters. Then on February 12th, 2018, at 12, 40, and 4 seconds, there was a school shooters 
Google search that was conducted previously, the, the videos tab was, was clicked on. On, Feb, uh, on February 12th, 2018, at 12.40 and 22 seconds, the video tab is still there with the school shooter YouTube this time. February 12th, 2018, 1240, 31 seconds in the afternoon. A website was accessed with the title Teen School Shooters Haunting Last YouTube Video. Shows him simulating shootout with friend, Mirror Online. And that was tied to mirror.co.uk. Then February 12th, 2018 at 1251 and 47 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree Parkland, Florida Google search. February 12th, 2018 at 119 and 5 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree Parkland, Florida Google search. February 12th, 2018, 657 and 27 seconds in the afternoon, Dollar Tree Parkland, Florida Google search. On February 12th, 2018 at 6.58 and 10 seconds, a YouTube search was conducted for Columbine. Again, February 12th, 2018 at 6.58 and 13 seconds, another YouTube search results for Columbine. Then on February 12th, 2018, 6.58 and 13 seconds in the evening, a video was accessed on YouTube with the title, Columbine's Chilling Legacy. And again, on February 12th, 2018, 658, 56 seconds in the evening, that same video, Columbine's Chilling Legacy. February 12th, 2018, 718 and 17 seconds at night, a YouTube search was conducted for school shooter. February 12th, 2018, 718 and 24 seconds, Again, school shooter search conducted on YouTube. On February 12th, 2018, at 725 and 51 seconds at night, a Google search was conducted. It says, how long does it take for a cop to show up at a school shooting? Then February 13th, 2008, at 105, 28 seconds in the afternoon, a YouTube search was conducted for PEKA shooting. There was a school shooting in Finland in 2007. The suspect's first name was PEKA. Okay, showing you page number five. February 13th, 2018, at 105 and 31 seconds. Again, the YouTube search for PEKA shooting. Then on February 13th, 2018, 105, 31 seconds in the afternoon, a YouTube video was accessed with the title, Just Testing My Gun, Pekka Eric Alvinen. That's the shooter from the Finland school shooting. February 13th, 2018, at 106 and 25 seconds. Again, that video was accessed, Just Testing My Gun, by Pekka Eric Alvinen. On February 13th, 2018, at 118 and 26 seconds in the afternoon, Foster the People Pumped Up Kicks video was accessed on YouTube. On February 13th, 2018, at 643 and 16 seconds in the evening, Foster the People Pumped Up Kicks video again was accessed on YouTube. February 13th, 2018, 643 and 17 seconds. The video was once again accessed, Foster the People Pumped Up Kicks. On February 13th, 2018, 9.56 and 36 seconds at night, a YouTube search was conducted, Good Songs to Play While Killing People. February 13th, 2018, 9.56, 43 seconds. Again, that YouTube search was conducted, Good Songs to Play While Killing People. February 13th, 2018, 10.01, 44 seconds at night, a YouTube search for school shooting MV was conducted. 
Then again, February 13th, 2018, 10.01 01 and 48 seconds. That same search was conducted on YouTube for school shooting MV. February 13th, 2018, 10.01 01 48 seconds. A YouTube video was accessed entitled School Shooter Hype Music Video. Then February 13th, 2018, 10.01 01 and 49 seconds. That video was once again accessed and reloaded school shooter hype music video. February 13th, 2018, 10.01 01 50, second, 50 seconds at night. That video was reloaded school shooter hype music video. February 13th, 2018, 10.01 50 seconds at night. The school shooter hype music video was accessed. February 13th, 2018, 10.02, 54 seconds at night. School shooter hype music video accessed again. February 13th, 2018, 10.02, 55 seconds. The school shooter hype music video was accessed. February 13th, 2018, 1002 59 seconds a YouTube search was conducted for school shooting MV February 13th 2018 1002 59 seconds school shooting MV February 13th 2018 1002 59 seconds the video on YouTube was accessed again the school shooter hype music video then on February 13th, 2018, at 10.03, 15 seconds, a YouTube search for school shooting MV. February 13th, 2018, at 10.06, 21 seconds, a Google search for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. February 13th, 2018, 10.10 10 and 54 seconds, Google search again for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. February 14th, 2018, 136 and 44 seconds in the afternoon. A search result on YouTube for school shooters. February 14th, 2018, 136 and 50 seconds. The YouTube search school shooter. February 14th, 2018, at 136, 50 seconds. The YouTube search school shooter. Then February 14th, 2018, at 136 50 seconds, YouTube video was accessed, Foster the People Pumped Up Kicks. February 14th, 2018, at 217 and 3 seconds in the afternoon, again, Foster the People Pumped Up Kicks. February 14th, 2018, at 2.17 and 4 seconds, Foster the People pumped up kicks. And the last one, February 14th, 2018, at 2.17 and 16 seconds, Foster the People pumped up kicks. And those last three correspond with the final minutes of the Uber ride to the school. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to show you space exhibit marked 24Q. These are a culmination of text messages between Nicholas Cruz and a contact by the name of JT and also a contact by the name of Warning Love of Your Life. Okay. And did you uh, extract that from the phone 954-821-107? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, I'd like to offer space exhibit 24Q. Is there any objection? Yes, ma'am. We renew and incorporate all objections and arguments in the MIL 401 and 402. Okay, over the defense objection, states exhibit 24Q for identification will be received as states 470. Okay, 
Detective Quick Look, now showing you Stacey's bit 470. Uh, could you explain what that is? Yes, so all of these messages occurred on February 14th of 2018 between two individuals, or between Nicholas Cruz and two individuals, one in the phone as JT and the other saved in the contacts as warning, love of your life. The messages are color coded, so the light blue is outgoing messages to JT. Outgoing from? From Nicholas Cruz. Yes, they're outgoing from 954-821-1007. Okay, and the other colors? So the light yellow is incoming messages from JT to Nicholas Cruz at 954-821-1007. If you look down a little further. Mr. Sachs, the jurors are sort of motioning to me that they can't see it. Okay. Too small. All right. I didn't know it was just me. And the people can't see it at all. It's not showing up on our screen now. Okay. We're having some technical difficulties. Ian, would you mind assisting, please? The document's not showing on the defense table. And um, now it's not showing on mine either. Okay. Yeah, I just pushed doc camera and it went on. Okay, members of the jury, by a show of hands, who cannot see see it? The the letters. Don't be don't be afraid. No, everybody can read <laughs> the letters. Okay, so I can go through. We don't have it. I don't have it. Well, we still don't. Oh, have it. the lawyers don't have the. the it's not showing on their screen. Yeah. But jurors, it is showing on your screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And it's on my screen. Is that on your screen? Yeah, it's on my it screen. It is, but not none, uh, none no, of the lawyers. None of the lawyers. No, it's back. It's back? Yes. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from both sides. Okay, everybody, everybody right. guys got it? Okay. Do me a favor. What? It went on and off. It's okay. okay. All right, if anybody's not getting it, just, just say something and we'll stop. So, uh, Detective Faircloth, again, the, the light blue, that's outgoing from 954-821-107, right? Correct. Okay, and the yellow? The yellow is incoming from, from uh, contact JT okay. to the phone number 954-821-1007. Then there are outgoing messages in a light orange. Those are outgoing to the contact warning love of your life from Nicholas Cruz at the phone number 954-821-1007. Okay. So, um, based on this, were you able to um, make a um, something where it's just one convert? This, this is three, two conversations going on at the same time, correct? correct? This is two conversations. All right. Were you able to call out or take out and make it individual text conversations between JT and 954-821-107, and then warning love of my life to 954-821-107. You understand? Know yes, saying? correct. So this is two conversations showing at once. We separated them out and have a conversation with JT and the phone number 954-821-1007, and then another conversation between warning love of your life to 954-821-1007. Okay. But what we had here, what you were showing us, net, which states exhibit 470. Correct. Was it all going on at the same time? Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Showing you now states exhibit 24S. And ask you if you can then try this. Yes. This is the text message conversation between Nicholas Cruz at 954-821-1007 and the contact in the phone, warning, love of your life. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer 24S. 
Is there any objection? Yes, ma'am. Same objection is pursuant to the MIL Chang Rules 401. <coughs> Okay, over the defense objection, 24S will be received as 471. Okay, here's 471. And I guess, is that big enough for everybody? Okay. All right. So uh, it starts at on two fourteen two thousand and eighteen at twelve forty two, right? Correct. So explain what's going on here. So all of these messages occurred on February fourteenth two thousand eighteen, and this is a conversation, just a conversation between Nicholas Cruz using the phone number nine five four eight two one one zero zero seven, and the contact warning love of your life. And these messages started at 12.42 and 52 seconds in the afternoon with an outgoing message from the phone to warning love of your life that said, hey. Then at 12.53 and six seconds in the afternoon, there was another outgoing message that said, do you want me to go away, Angie? At 12.53 and 12 seconds in the afternoon, another outgoing message that said, I need to know. Then at 12.57 and 42 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming response from the contact, warning love of your life, says, you're scaring me and I want you to leave me alone. Then an outgoing message at 12.58 and 41 seconds in the afternoon, dot, 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 like leave you alone for good. At 12.59 and 30 seconds, another outgoing message, Angie, I need to know. 107 and 39 seconds in the afternoon, another outgoing message, hello. 146 and five seconds in the afternoon, another outgoing message, Angie, it's very important. Then at 2.05 and five seconds in the afternoon, a response comes in says, I'm in class. I can't just text you whenever you want me to. So stop. Then at 2.05 and nine seconds, another incoming message, that annoying double texting and be respectful and let me answer when. Then at 2.05 and 10 seconds, I can. At 2.07 and 38 seconds, there's an outgoing message that says, I love you. At 2.07 and 58 seconds, another outgoing message that says, you will always know I love you. At 2.08 and 5 seconds, an outgoing message of a crying face. At 2.08 and 44 seconds, an outgoing message, eat well, sleep well, and behave well, my love. Then at 2.08 and 57 seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message of I, uh, symbols that represent an, I, an emoji that from what I've been able to determine means jo uh, joyful. Then at 2.09 and 27 seconds in the afternoon, there is an incoming message that says, you know I have a boyfriend, right? At 2.09 and 41 seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, no, I don't. At 2.09 and 47 seconds, another outgoing message, doesn't matter anymore. At 2.09, 51 seconds, another outgoing message, I love you. At 2.09 and 53 seconds, another outgoing message with multiple of the emojis, icons, at 2.10 and two seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, I've told you that before, and so has Gigi. At 2.10 and 27 seconds, there's an outgoing message that says, Angie. At 2.10 and 33 seconds, another outgoing message, you're the love of my life. At 2.10 and 41 seconds in the afternoon, 
An outgoing message, IDC, which means I don't care, if you have a boyfriend. 2.11 and 3 seconds in the afternoon, outgoing message, you've been the few, the only few. 2.13 and 23 seconds in the afternoon, outgoing message, you're the greatest person I have ever met. At 2.16 and 54 seconds in the afternoon, another outgoing message that says, I love you. Okay. And were you able to call out and separate the conversation between 954-821-107 and JT? Yes, sir. And let me show you State's Exhibit Mark 24N. Yes, this is the this is the text message conversation between 954-821-1007 and JT on February 14th, 2018. Going on the same time as the conversation with, with morning, morning love of your life, correct. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer 24 10. Is there any objection? This time we renew and incorporate all arguments in D and Okay, over the defense objection states 24N will be received as 472. State's Exhibit 472. Yes, sir. Okay, so what's that? These are the text messages between 954-821-1007 and the contact JT. Okay, and the first uh, text? So again, all of these occurred on February 14th, 2018, starting at 9.35 and four seconds in the morning. There is an outgoing message that says, by the way, my boss called, told me he has someone for later. Then at 9.35 and nine seconds in the morning, another outgoing message, so no work today. Then there's an incoming message at 9.35 and 28 seconds that says, okay, cool. At 12.37 and six seconds, there's an outgoing message that says, yo. Then at 12.37 12 and 18 seconds, another outgoing message that says, are people coming over tonight? Then at 12.37 and 23 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message says was good at 12 37 and 32 seconds in the afternoon another incoming message that says idk which stands for i don't know why at 12 37 and 52 seconds in the afternoon a another incoming message that says if they do it can't be all night at 12 38 and 14 seconds in the afternoon there's an outgoing message says, so who would come? At 12.38 and 34 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, Caroline and Jordan. At 12.39 and one second in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, you think Caroline would come to see me? At 12.39 and 27 seconds, there's an incoming message that says IDK, which again is I don't know, but I'll find out if I can have people over. At 12.40 and 11 seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, can you find out now? At 12.40 and 31 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, I just asked. At 12.40 and 56 seconds, an outgoing message says, thank you. At 12.41 and eight seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message says, yeah. At 12.43 and 10 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message says, did you find out you can? 
at 1243 and 34 seconds, there is an incoming message says, give it a few minutes. Then at 1248 and 18 seconds, there's another incoming message that says, we can do it. At 1251 and 47 seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, you're not fucking with me, are you? <coughs> At 1252 and 15 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message that says, no, I just need to ask the girls now. At 1252 and 35 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message that says, okay, at 12.52 and 43 seconds in the afternoon, another outgoing message that says, let me know soon. At 12.53 and 37 seconds, there's an incoming message that says, I will, why? At 12.53 and 42 seconds, another incoming message, you got a date? At 12.53 and 51 seconds, an outgoing message that says, no, 12.53 and 59 seconds, another outgoing message, I just want to know. At 12.55 and 47 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, LOL, for laugh out loud, okay. At 12.56 and three seconds in the afternoon, another incoming message that says, but why soon? At 12.58 and 8 seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, because I might see a movie. Okay. <clears throat> six up on top. A little bit further. There we go. <clears throat> At... 12.58 and 42 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, okay. And then again at 102 and six seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message that says, okay. At 132 and three seconds in the afternoon, there's an outgoing message that says, how's school going? At 132 and 19 seconds in the afternoon, there's an incoming message that says, hell. At 1.32 and 29 seconds, an outgoing message that says LOL for laugh out loud. At 1.33 and one second in the afternoon, an outgoing message that says, doesn't school end in one and a half hours? At 1.33 and 30 seconds, there's an incoming message that says an hour and seven minutes. <coughs> At 1.33 and 42 seconds, there's an outgoing message that says, oh, okay. 1.44 and 18 seconds, an outgoing message. What class are you in? 1.44 and 44 seconds, an incoming message, U.S. history. At 1.45 and 17 seconds, an outgoing message, who's your teacher? 1.45 and 19 seconds, a question mark. At 146 and 59 seconds, an incoming message that says coach short. At 151 and 19 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message, I had him as a teacher. At 151 and 36 seconds, there's an incoming message that says cool. At 151 and 52 seconds, there's another incoming message, what does he look like? At 152 and 18 seconds, there's an outgoing message. He's bolid and is in the back of the school. At 152 and 33 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message that says yes. 152 and 55 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message. Ask him if he know a Nick Cruz. At 154 and 18 seconds, an incoming message. Okay, I will at the end of class. The rest of these messages occurred during the Uber ride at 2.09 and 12 seconds in the afternoon. Sends an outgoing message, says, hey man. 
At 2.09 and 26 seconds, an incoming message says yes. At 2.09 and 26 seconds, an outgoing message, I have to tell you something important soon. At 2.09 and 39 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message, okay, what happened? At 2.10 and 9 seconds, an outgoing message, nothing, man. At 2.10 and 15 seconds, an incoming message. Text it to me, dude. I don't need this right. At 2.10 and 36 seconds, another incoming message, right now. And you better not be fucking with me. At 2.11 and 19 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message says, what? Question mark, question mark, question mark, exclamation point. At 2.11 and 22 seconds, an outgoing message, Dude, nothing bad, bro. At 2.11 and 32 seconds, an incoming message, okay, good. At 2.11 and 37 seconds, an incoming message, then what is it? At 2.11 and 53 seconds in the afternoon, outgoing message, I'm heading to the movies. At 2.11 and 57 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message, IWA at 211 and 12 seconds an incoming message WTF which stands for what the fuck about the fire at 212 and 22 seconds in the afternoon an incoming message I got Caroline to come okay 66 <clears throat> at 212 and 27 seconds in the afternoon, an incoming message, I got Caroline to come. At 2.12 and 33 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message that says, ah, fuck. At 2.12 and 51 seconds, an outgoing message, well, too late now, I didn't expect her to come. 2.13 and 18 seconds, an incoming message, WTF, which again stands for, what the fuck? Dude, you better stay. I got her to come for you. At 2.13 and 39 seconds in the afternoon, an outgoing message, what time she coming? At 2.13 and 55 seconds, an incoming message, after six-ish. At 2.14 and five seconds, an incoming message, Go to the movies tomorrow. And then at 2.16 and 43 seconds, just a couple of moments before the Uber arrives at the school, there's an outgoing message that says, too late, man. At 2.17 and 13 seconds, there's an incoming message, I hope you're back before 6. Okay. And that was the extent of the text messages? Yes, sir. Okay. And now let me show you... States exhibits 24L, 24M, and 24K. Thank you, sir. Chair Clove has you to these next slide. Yes, sir. What are they? These are videos that were recovered off of the phone extraction. Okay, so 9548211107. Yes, sir. And you did the extraction yourself? Yes, sir. And you obtained these videos? Yes, sir. Okay, this time, Your Honor. I'd like to play 24K, 24L, and 24M. <clears throat> Ten-minute recess. Please uh, leave your notepads behind, and please do not discuss the case with um, with each other or anyone else. Thank you.
The jurors have been excused. We're, this is this is going to be a recess just long enough for a bathroom, quick bathroom break. So please, um, if you don't need to use the facilities, remain here so that we can start back up as soon as possible. Yeah, sure. yeah Are present. Everyone else may be seated. Mr. Staff, you may continue. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> so I just uh, showed you, uh, De uh, Detective Faircloth, 24K, 24L, and 24M, and you explained these were downloads from uh, 954 821 107, correct? Yes, sir. All right, Your Honor, I want to introduce 24K, 24L, and 24M. Is there any objection? Yes, ma'am. Renew objections pursuant to the MIL 10 as well as object pursuant to rules 401, 403. Objection 24K will be received received as 473, 24L will be received as 474, and 24M will be received as 475. Three videos. The first one, um, 24K, what time uh, was on there, the time and the date? So the first video that was recorded was February 8th, 2018 at 2.39 and 19 seconds in the afternoon. Okay. Your Honor, may we publish this, please? You may. Here's the plan. I'm gonna go take an Uber in the afternoon before 40. From there, I'll go into the hold, hold on. Could you, could you start to school? And, and so, play the whole thing, please. All right. So here's the plan. I'm gonna go take an Uber 
in the afternoon before 2.40. From there, I'll go into the uh, to school campus, walk up the stairs, unload my bags, and get my AR and shoot people down at the main, was it the main courtyard? Await, and people will die. Okay, and uh, the second one, uh, what time was that made, recorded, uh, that you found in your extraction? The second video was recorded on February 11th, 2018, at 1.47 in the afternoon. Okay. Um, 474 that I just gave? Yeah. Yeah, 474. Thank you. No problem. Today is the day. The day that it be all begins. The day of my massacre shall begin. All the kids in school will f***ing in fear and hide. From the wrath of my power they will know who I am. I am nothing. I am no one. My life is nothing and meaningless. Everything that I hold dear I let go beyond your half. Every day I see the world ending another day. I live a lone life, live in seclusion and solitude. I hate everyone and everything. With the power of my AR you will all know who I am. I had enough of being told what to do and when to do. I had enough of being Tell me that I'm an idiot and a dumbass. But in real life, you're all the dumbass. You're all stupid and brainwashed by these fucking political government programs. You will all see. You will all know who my name is. My love for you, Angie, will never go away. I hope to see you in the afterlife. On one day or another, you will end and we'll all die. Okay, and uh, Detective Fairclaw's the third one, time and date? The third video was February 11th, 2018, one fifty-five and 5 seconds in the afternoon. Okay. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds. I think I can do a good done. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, we'll all know who I am. <laughs> You're all going to die. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, yeah. Can't wait. No, I have no further questions of uh, Detective Fairfax. Defense, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, the state would uh, move in these business records 24X, 24Y, 24Z, 25A, and 25D. Since evidence are self authenticating, I believe the defense has already looked at them.
states 24Y will be received as 476, 24Z, 477, 25A, 478, and 25B, 479. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. You can be seated. Please speak into the microphone. State your full name and spell your last name for the record. John Vincent Navarra, N-A-V-A-R-R-A. -A -R -R -A. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm retired now, but the, my last position was uh, I was a teacher at uh, MSD, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Okay. And what did you do before you were a teacher? I was in the Army. Uh, I did logistics and administration type work for 22 years. Okay. And what did you teach at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Junior ROTC. Okay. What is Junior ROTC? Well, it's a, it's a high school course. It's accredited, and it, it teaches soft skills to our students. Uh, their, our mission there was to uh, encourage uh, young people to become better citizens, and our goal was that they graduate from high school and go on to some post-secondary uh, high school uh, education. And what are some of the things uh, you taught at JRT? Well, the actual curriculum is called leadership education and training, and there are lessons in uh, leadership, of course, uh, um, citizenship, uh, health and welfare, physical fitness, geography, American history and uh, uh, government, communications, and emotional wellness. Okay. And how long were you teaching uh, JROTC at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? I taught a total of 12 years. When did you start and when did you uh, I, I started in 2017 and I left in 2019. Okay. 2000. What, when did you start? 2017. You started at Marjorie Stoneman in 2017. I thought you said you taught there for 12 years. Right. Was my math wrong? Well, when did you leave? <laughs> uh, uh, no. I thought my math was bad. <laughs> 2007, was it? Yes, yes. Uh, when, I'm sorry. That's don't. It's okay. It's all right. I taught junior ROTC, not math. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, 
12 years starting in 2007, right? Okay. Yes. All right. And is there, uh, how does it work? Is it just one class of JROTC or two classes? How does it work? Well, the, a, a full load in junior ROTC would be uh, four years. If a student went in, they would go in as a, a let one and go to two, three, and four, let meaning leadership, education, and training. But we would have you know, the full load of classes, uh, two teachers per, per day. Okay. And uh, you're a sergeant, you, I'm sure you still are a sergeant, right? Yeah, uh, first, first sergeant, sergeant, yes. First sergeant, okay. So I'd like to call your attention uh, to uh, 2015 uh, school year. Uh, did you have a, a student by the name of uh, Nicholas Jacob Cruz? Yes. What did you have him for? He was in my junior ROTC class. Okay. And uh, approximately how many students would you say you had in your class at that time? Oh, probably 20. 20? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, did they wear uniforms, or how, how did it work? They, there is a uniform requirement, which they wear once a week. It's a, a dress uniform. Okay. Is there any other type of, of dress that's had by uh, your students at JROTC? We would alternate the... the the dress uniform with uh, a polo shirt and black pants. Okay, let me show you state's exhibit, Mark. One of two. Sergeant, you recognize it? Yes, that's that's one of our polos. Okay, and it's Mark J R O T C Marjorie Stone Douglas. Yes. Okay. So, how often? Well, how long did you have Nicholas Cruz as a student? He, he was in our program for about two years. I taught him uh, regularly for one year and as a let one. And then he, next year he went into the next classroom, one level up to let two. Okay. So it was a, a year, two semesters? Is that the way it worked? Yes. Okay. So how often would you see him? I saw him. Uh, every other day during class, I think, we, you know, the block scheduling. Okay. And then I would see him daily, except for Friday, during marksmanship practice. Okay. What is marksmanship? Marksmanship is a, um, a non-aggressive uh, shooting sport uh, that stresses concentration, focus, uh, precision, um, uh, patience, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of concentration. How, how do you get into marksmanship? Did you just apply, or how do you get in? Well, we announced that we are going to start marksmanship, so the students come in after school, and uh, it could be 20 to 30. And the first thing that we do is we give them a safety test. Well, we give them a safety class first, uh, range and rifle safety. And then they take the test, which is 100 questions, and they have to score 100 before they move on any, th any further. Okay, and you're talking about rifles. What kind of rifles are they? They're uh, air, rifles, air rifles, pellet, pellet guns. Pellet guns. Um, yeah. Okay, so they take the test. Those who pass the test, uh, and they go on to the next. Mm -hmm. What What is the next? We'll We'll give them um, some preliminary instructions on how to hold the the air gun uh, in the prone position, because we and how to load a pellet safely. Um, we give them, because by then they understand what range safety is and how to behave on the range. They have to shoot three pellets towards a paper target 10 meters away. Uh, in, uh, in they, we call it grouping. They have to group the pellets the first round into the size of a quarter. Okay. Second round, the size of a nickel, and then down to a dime. And once they've done that, then... They're, they're on the way to be on the team, but we then we have to zero the sights. The sights are precision sights, and you can adjust them, you know, up and down. So if if they're if the bullseye is one position, but their their group is over here, we adjust the sights so the grouping goes onto the bullseye. Some make it, and then and some don't. Okay, and once they make the march, it's a marksmanship team. Mm -hmm. so we. What do they do as a team? Well, we, there's four, a four-person team, and uh, I had as many as four teams at one time. Uh, but then they're, they're given uh, a position on a team, and those teams will compete against each other. To Then we rank them A, B, C, D uh, teams. Okay. 
And do they uh, go to meets and stuff like that? Yes, other, yes. Uh, other schools? Uh, yes. Uh, off, quite often we, we uh, competed at several different schools and depending on how many teams were allowed, we would take them and they would compete. Okay. And uh, with, with um, the marksmanship, are there grades like uh, marksmen? What are they? Well, it's an extracurricular activity. Okay. But there are badges that they could win if they shoot well. And um, Nicholas Cruz earned the, the, the sharpshooter badge. Okay. And how do you how do you get a sharpshooter? You have to score, uh, I think it's twenty to thirty um, uh, uh, points in the prone and standing position. Okay. All right. And the the marksmanship program you taught that after school? Yes. Okay. And that's four days a week. Not it doesn't include Friday, correct? That's not on Friday. Okay. And uh, are there other uh, things you achieve, awards you achieve by being in JROTC? Well, yes, there's lots of different awards. Um, there's an award for almost everything. Um, the, the kids wear a uniform and they get to wear ribbons and they earn the ribbons by participating in different activities, uh, rather be marksmanship, uh, the Raiders, uh, drill and ceremony, um, uh, marching in a parade, doing um, some service, uh, community work, and that type of thing. Okay. I want to show you now, uh, Sergeant, uh, three <coughs> videos uh, that have been introduced in, into evidence. One we have is uh, now 473 and 474 and 475. Uh, have you seen those? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, okay. and, and I, I've initialed each one. Okay, and you, you viewed them and mm -hmm. saw them? Yes, and, yes, sir. Uh, two of them were just voices, correct? Yes. Did you recognize that voice on those two videos? Yes. And whose voice was that? It was Nicholas Cruz. And when the, the, the third one was the face, mm -hmm. did you recognize? Yes, that? I did. And who was that? Nicholas Cruz. All right, do you see Nicholas Cruz in the court? Yes, today, I'm sitting, I'm sitting okay. right over there. Okay, over there. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't. He's sitting right over there at the end of the table. Blue sweater? Yes, that's him. Madam Recorder, with the court's permission, would you like to reflect that Sergeant Navarro has identified the defendant, Nicholas Jacob Cruz? Thank you, Sergeant. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Excuse me for me. Sure. <laughs> Sergeant, if I may, Your Honor. Sure. Okay. Uh, did uh, Nicholas Cruz have permission? Were you on uh, campus on February the 14th, 2018? Yes. Okay. Did Nicholas Cruz have permission to be on that campus? No, he did not. February the 14th, 2018? He did no, not. he did not. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Defense, any questions? Good afternoon, Sergeant. Good afternoon. You are aware that Mr. Cruz was an exceptional student, right? An exceptional student? Right, an ESE student. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. And that he had an individual education plan. Yes. And that's a summary of that is given to you prior to him entering your class, correct? Yes. And you are aware of his disabilities for which he received services, right? I couldn't name them now, but I was at the time. Okay. Um, do you recall that being emotional behavioral disabilities at all? I never witnessed any, but I, I would have read it in, in his IEP. Okay. What about a language impairment? I don't recall that, but I never saw him having problems with language in my class. Okay. Um, you were also aware that when he was in your class, he was only in one other class at MSD at the time. Yes. The first year, yes. And that most of his time was spent at Cross Creek. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. Which is a school for those with emotional behavioral disabilities. Yes. Um, were you aware that his psychiatrist from Cross Creek stated that she was not recommending that Mr. Cruz be put in JR, 
J-R-O-T-C. Now, I didn't know that per se, but he did come to me one time and said, he said, First Sergeant, they might, they, they might let me come here all year next year. And he was, he was uh, excited and looking forward to that. Sure. Um, you were aware from his cadet data sheet, which you get for all the students in JROTC, correct, that his mother had stated he was low-end autistic. Yes. And you viewed him as not being academically proficient. Would you agree with that? Well, he, was, he did well in junior ROTC because we're not an academically hard class. And he was uh, quiet and, and well-behaved, and oftentimes that, that is worth a lot in a classroom. Um, he, he passed his tests, and he, he participated in such a way that he was an average student. Would you agree that you were aware that Mr., even though you hadn't observed it, you were aware that Mr. Cruz had some emotional issues? Yes. Um, and that he also seemed to have some social impairments. He didn't have a lot of friends or hang out with anybody in the class. Yes. Okay, just a moment, Judge. Sure. Thank you so much, Sergeant. You're welcome. State, anything else? No, thank you, Sergeant. Okay, thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Judge, would you like more? Sure. Judge, um, we have no problem with the first paragraph that mirrors the standard uh, jury instructions under victim impact evidence under 7.11. Um, there's nothing inappropriate about that, and if requested, it should be given. So uh, the first uh, paragraph is what's given. The second paragraph um, is saying the same thing. Um, but it's it's not part of the standard instruction, so we would ask you not to read the second the second paragraph. about it and to ensure that these jurors truly understand because they are going to be hearing a lot of this, um, we need to make sure they fully understand that they are not to be considering this and determining whether the aggravating factors were proven are sufficient, um, whether they are, um, whether they outweigh the mitigating circumstances, 
and they are not to consider it in making their final determination on the appropriate sentence in this case. Your Honor, if I may, um, there would normally not be jury instruction at this point at the proceedings, and the only reason the state is agreeing to any instruction at all is an abundance of caution, because there are 17 victims in this case, so there is more victim impact than if there were just one or two or three victims of a homicide. That's the only reason that we're agreeing to an instruction. The second part of the instruction goes to actual what the jury would do during deliberations, and that's not proper at this point in the proceedings because you keep instructing the jury not to begin deliberations. And giving that second part of the instruction actually has to do with deliberations. You're only telling the jury in an abundance of caution what victim impact is by giving the first part of the instruction, which is it's not an aggravating circumstance. We'd ask that you give the beginning part of the instruction and not the second part. Uh, the the actual um, standard jury instruction where this was uh, taken or what this is based on reads victim impact evidence. Give you know what, I'm sorry, before you start, will you please give me the, the uh, numbers? So I yeah, it's, it's 7.11. 7.11. Yeah. Could you give me just one second, please? And then it has an italicized victim impact evidence. Yes. It says also give at the time victim impact evidence is admitted if requested. So um, it should be given at this time because we are requesting it and we're requesting that the entire instruction will be read. Um, All right. I'm going to read the standard instruction that's contained within the standard jury instructions as written. Well, Judge, we did agree at least to the first paragraph, so we would ask that you read it. We modified it slightly, so we would ask that, uh, because that is agreed to, that you would read that first that where did paragraph. You, where did you modify it? You are about to hear testimony versus you have heard evidence? Yes, it's the tense we changed, and we also, um, yeah, I mean, we just modified it to fit more with this case and the timing. took out friends and community. Are you certain that the impact statement is not going to include? The, the, the standard language says that I should read, you have heard or will hear evidence about the impact of the murders on the family, friends, and community of the decedent. Those are in um, parentheses, as in you can read one or all. And in the instruction that you proposed, it only has family, so I don't know if it should be all your honor. It should be friends. It should be from the standard language. Yes. That's fine.
All right. I'm going to read exactly what is in the standard instruction, but I'm going to change the tense. In other words, you will hear evidence, or you're about to hear uh, evidence about the impact of this murder on the family, friends, and community of the decedent. All right, what else? Judge, we're asking that you read it as we wrote it, saying testimony. If the court's not going to read that they can't consider it, then um, in, in their deliberations, then we're asking that it be called testimony. Um, otherwise, they might mistake it for evidence of an aggravating factor. The thing is that the legislators who drafted these instructions and the people that are part of the of the um, the jury instruction committee would have contemplated that. What you're suggesting is that I read something other than what they drafted. Right, and it was something that the state agreed with. We're just asking that it be read this way. See, I'm not inclined to. I'm, I'm inclined to read it right from the instructions. I think it's the safest way and the way that it's intended unless there's some strong reason why it should be read differently. I understand that the tense has to the tenses have to be changed because I have to say you're you are now going to hear evidence about the impact of the murder, but but to change anything else I, I don't see why it's necessary. We agree. Okay, what, what was the other objection from the defense? Well, just, we're just renewing um, our previous motions. In DP 38, we moved to declare section 921 141 <coughs> for statutes unconstitutional. That was denied on December 7th of 2021. We also moved to preclude the use of the term evidence when referring to victim impact testimony. That was also denied on December 7th of 2021. That's DP 39. Um, <clears throat> DP 40 and DP 41 are not. Um, we don't need to renew those. We have been working with the state on those. DP 42, motion for victim impact information to be presented solely to the court. We're renewing our objection or our motion on that. Uh, denied on December 7th of 2021. <coughs> DP 43, motion for victim impact statements to be read by a neutral party. We're renewing that motion. That was denied by the court on December 13th of 2021. DP 44, which is a motion for an instruction to families during the victim impact testimony. That was denied also on December 13th of 2021. Motion for special instruction to witnesses during victim impact testimony for statements. That was also denied on December 13th of 2021. And then finally, Judge, the DP46 was a motion uh, for us to do our own separate video recording of the victim impact testimony. That was denied on December 13th, 2021. So we are requesting that if any issues do arise, that um, the recording that's already going on in here be made a part of the record. Thank you. Okay, now, because you're going to go out of order, it's my understanding you're going to have one or two victim impact witnesses, then a fact witness? Your Honor, if, if it's possible, um, because it's later in the day and the, the victims have prepared their statements, if we could, we only have three families who would be testifying today for a total of seven witnesses. They're relatively short. Okay. They've all prepared statements. So if we could finish out the day with these seven and then go back to the fact witnesses tomorrow, that would be the state's preference. Sure, today. that's fine. I, the only reason I was asking is because I think I should tell the jurors uh, not only the instruction on the victim impact testimony or evidence, but also that uh, due to scheduling, um, some scheduling conflicts, we're going to go out of order and, or just that they're gonna hear a fact witness tomorrow, otherwise it might be confusing. That's fine, Your Honor. Let me just think of a way to phrase it. Do you have a defense? Do you have any objection to me letting them know that no. there's going to be some victim impact testimony? Then there's going to be a fact witness, and then more victim impact. That's how. It's, that's the order. Yes, Do you have any objection to me letting them know? No, you're. Right. And I can read tomorrow before the rest of the impact 
test the victim impact testimony can read the instruction again so that they know that now we're moving over to this other evidence. That's appropriate. So you're going to, for tomorrow, you're going to call the fact witnesses first and then the victim impact testimony second. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Okay, is there, is there uh, anything else before we bring the jury back in? So you're going to call, I'm sorry, you're going to call three witnesses today and then you... No, three, no, seven witnesses from a total of three families. And just so you know, Your Honor, uh, some of the families would like to come up, like two members of the family come up together, and that's why we have two seats up there. Sure. Um, I think it would be better for, for those family members, not all <coughs> families want to do it that way. So if you, if two of them come up together, maybe for ease, you could swear them both at this, the same time. I don't know how you want to do it, um, but they will prepare statements that have um, been reviewed and um, it should go smoothly. So there's going to be seven people who are going to read a statement. Yes. Several of them are going to come together, Yes. but they'll read them one at a time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I will swear them, both people or whoever's coming up, I'll swear them in and have them state their name for the record. And then whoever goes first, I will have them, in other words, I'll swear them in and then I'll say whoever's going, I'll have them both state their name for the record and then I'll ask them which one's going first. That's, Is that suitable? That's fine, Jim. <laughs> okay. Jurors are present. You all may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in just a few minutes you're going to hear evidence about the impact of these murders on the family, friends, and or the community of the decedents. This evidence is presented to show the particular victim's uniqueness as an individual and the resultant, lo resultant loss by the decedent's death. However, you may not consider this evidence as an aggravating factor. State. Thank you, Your Honor. State would like to call Ms. Patricia Oliver, please. <coughs> State will also be calling Ms. Andrea Gersey. There's another lady behind me. Okay. So stand away to be Yeah. Okay, would you both please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. Thank you. You can both put your hands down, and if the young lady to my right would please state your full name for the record. Yeah. Andrea Garci, G-H-E-R-S-I. 
And ma'am, would you please state your full name for the record? Yes, Patricia Oliver, O-L-I-V-E-R. Okay, you can both go ahead and be seated, and then whoever is going to speak first, maybe you want to sit closest to me so you'll be closest to the microphone, okay? Yep, this is your mic. Okay, that's it. Oh, they have an additional yeah. microphone. So, what, oh. are you going to speak first, ma'am? I'm my mom's. Your mom's going to speak first. Okay, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mrs. Oliver. Good afternoon. Are you the mother of Joaquin Oliver? Yes, I am. I'm going to show you a photograph that's been marked as State's Exhibit 72. May I approach the witness room? May. Can you please identify this picture? Is this your son? Yes. Will you please show it to the jury? Thank you, Ms. This Oliver. is the day that he was uh, saying, celebrating his senior year. Ms. Oliver, thank you. Did you present, did you prepare a statement to share with the jury today? Yes. Okay. And you have a copy of that statement? Yes, I do. Could you please read it for us? Yes. <clears throat> My adorable Mipo. I used to write you birthday cards, sticky notes, with instructions about how to reheat his food after school, reminders how getting ready for a game or practice for the sport he was playing then, or a pending core at home. This is the right time to let everybody know how special Joaquin was. Papi and Mami decided it was time to have a baby, and Joaquin came into our life. He was the missing link of our family. During the whole pregnancy, we enjoyed every moment of it, including the doctor's visits. August 4th, the best day of our family life, our beautiful, dear little boy, big eyes, has arrived, Joaquin. We always had ways to show how much we love him. His dad was always with me when I had to feed him late at night. His sister, whom he called beautiful girl, gave up vacations with her aunt Isabel to stay home and take care of him. She didn't want to miss a moment with him. She was always next to his babysitter, Josefina, who gave him so much love and care during his first year. For the moment he came into my life, he taught me how to express my emotions physically. We hugged each other, we held hands. He blew me kisses and sometimes said, Mommy, did you see I blow you a kiss? He brought me a smile to my face, gave me happiness, and that fits my soul madly. He slept in our bed since he was very little. We cuddled and shared the same pillow. I loved when he came to our room as a teenager at night, waking me up and saying, Mommy, I can't sleep. Can I sleep with you? I felt that even though he was a teenager, he was still, he still had a baby soul. He needed mommy to hug him and hold his hands during his sleep, a feeling that he's vivid until today. I relieve and try to find a moment that is only ours. A sleeping will never be the same. He was loved, hugged, and cuddled by everyone his grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. He missed dearly by them all. It's been four years and four months since he was taken from us, his friends, and his family. We miss him more than words can say and love him dearly. While we will never be the same, 
we have found a way to deal with, absent, with his absence and be motivated by helping others living with this kind of loss and pain to move forward. I always deny speaking of the way he was taken from us, but today I must let the world hear from me. To accept that he is not physically here with us it still is an issue for me. Why? Because it hurts me very deeply. I must let the listeners feel how painful it is to live with this deep hole in my heart. I can deal with my family gatherings. It is impossible to deal with everybody that was used to get together with and he is not there. That's done. I can't share happy moments or see pictures with all his cousins and he's not there. I keep inside an anger that I consciously don't feel, but when I see myself in a picture or on a video, it shows in my face putting out my real feelings. Smiling has become harsh. Our life, our life was disrupted suddenly, and now I keep talking to me, to him, in my mind. I have to imagine the moments we were supposed to live and share with him. It hurts to think of preps for graduation from high school, the outfit he was planning to wear. He always wants to plan things. I remember taking, talking about the belt he wanted to wear for the big day. College, he wanted to go to Orlando, then to Tali. As a family, we debated the best option, always having great chats about his projects in the present and future. I miss every moment of that. I miss the fluent way we used to talk, while we got ready in the mornings, always updating us about our day, him, his sister, and me. College. He was supposed to graduate this year in business with a major in sports management, which was his plan. All the future ahead of him was taken from us. Getting his first professional job, moving on his own, cooking or doing laundry, everything he was supposed to learn from me, and being part of, the, of his growth as an adult is no more. Joaquin, the young adult, the one who plans to get married and travel the world, and his dear girlfriend share with me going to Africa. All these dreams and could be have been taken away. His friends, I didn't know he had that many friends, girls, boys, little kids. They all miss him endlessly. I feel in my heart the suffering they all endured since the day he was taken from us. They came home devastated, crying. Their lives are changed forever. They share with me how he impacted their life. They say his empathy, loving soul, passion, friendship, the meaning of love, energy, contagious smile, he value of everything, everyone, belief in himself, he stood up for what is right, was genuine to himself and appreciated orders. Our life has been shattered and changed forever. Thank you, Mrs. Oliver. <laughs> Next, Ms. Gersey. Okay, you, can, you can stay seated there. Oh, this one? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me tell you about my brother, Joaquin. I vividly remember the phone call we received when he was born and everything changed. I went from being an only child to having a baby brother, my very own baby doll. With our age difference and moving to a new country, where both my parents had to work endless hours, my relationship with Joaquin changed. I took on the role of mother figure more so than just his older sister. Joaquin was energetic, vibrant, loud, confident, strong, empathetic, understanding, smart, passionate, outgoing, playful, 
loving, competitive, rebellious, funny, loyal, and constantly spoke up when he felt something was just was not just. As his older sister, I've always been very protective of him. At the end of the day, even if he was 6'1", I always saw him as my baby. I always felt Joaquin would have a big future filled with, with prosperity, success, and lots of love. When February the 14th came, all those hopes and dreams ended. I will never forget sitting in the living room with my parents saying how a part of us died that day with Joaquin. And what is left of us had to learn to live an empty life. My life without my brother Joaquin has changed in so many ways. It's not just the day-to-day -day things, but also my future, and it hurts me. What happens when we run out of pictures, when we get old and the memories start to fade, when I get married and you aren't there, when I have kids and they don't have an uncle? What happens every single day when I want to call you and I can't? When every single Christmas that every family gets together but ours, when birthdays aren't a celebration anymore, when nighttime comes and thoughts creep in and we realize you are truly gone. This is life now and it hurts. It hurts a lot, not just today, but every single day. I feel an unimaginable void in my being when I think about all those things, when it's not just future events that add more pain to my heart, but the simply daily reminders, like your empty room, driving by the baseball fields, the basketball courts, when I go to call someone on my favorites list and your name is right at the top. When there are certain songs I simply cannot hear, the list is endless. One afternoon driving past McDonald's, I remember being at a red light while Joaquin was telling me how one of his friend's sisters was moving away for college. And Joaquin said, I don't know what I would do if you moved out. Well, now it's me that doesn't know what to do with you being gone forever. Joaquin, I love you, I miss you, and I will never forget that smile of yours that could light up any room and make anyone's day better. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, ladies. Victoria Gonzalez. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. And when you're seated, please tell us your full name and spell your last name. Victoria Gonzalez, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Good afternoon, Ms. Gonzalez. Hello. Are you the girlfriend of Joaquin Oliver? It's a little complicated to answer that because I was not labeled the girlfriend until the day he died. Um, I'll give you the label that we gave each other was always soulmate. That was my partner. Yeah. Have you prepared a statement I for have. to be read in court today? I have. Can you read it for us, please? Yes. going to do it. <laughs> okay. Joaquin Oliver. <sighs> A name etched into the depth of my soul. When I met Joaquin, my life was instantly shape-shifted, transformed into wonder. I remember having visions of beings birthed from stars and questioning my belief completely of life. He taught me magic. 
Joaquin was magic, personified. Love personified. He stepped into a room and the entirety of vibration were heightened. In an instant, those around him felt more comfortable in their own skin. He radiated a light so deeply contagious. Just one look into his eyes and it's like you knew you were home on this planet. Joaquin loved to make people smile. He loved to dance down the hallways at school with his headphones on and the wires dangling alongside him. He loved to sit in my passenger seat and sing his heart out. From the Beatles, Cher, Madonna, Led Zeppelin, to Frank Ocean, Playboy Cardi, and Drake. He embraced music, art, cultures of all kind. He was simply just happy to be human. His mere presence wrote his story. You could feel his dedication for love in the air surrounding him. He worked so hard to fulfill each day. He worked so hard in class. All he wanted was to graduate and make his family proud. He wanted to travel and run away with me to Paris. We loved the movie theater. Those employees saw the two of us walking hand in hand multiple times a week. Popcorn, root beer, and cookie dough bites in the hands that were free. Same order, every single time. That Valentine's Day of 2018, I will never forget. We had tickets to IPIC that night, yet another movie date to celebrate the authentic love we shared. Nothing extra or extravagant. Our gifts to each other being ourselves. And of course, the stuffed elephants and yellow chrysanthemums I won't forget the sight of in his grip atop his bouncing knees as he sat at the bus loop bench that morning, anxiously awaiting my arrival. I remember wondering if amongst the chaos later that day, we would still have a quiet night together at the theater. I lost myself that day. I lost my soulmate in the flesh. I lost the voice that filled the atmosphere of my car. It's so quiet now. I lost the friend who understood me most. I lost the excitement to watch him grow up. I lost innocence. I lost purity. I lost the love letters he was writing for me in that fourth period creative writing class. I never actually received them. They were pinned to his shirt. I miss my best friend and the way he made me feel full. I miss the laughter from his lips and the glimmer in his eyes. I miss the light that once lived in me. I see Joaquin in every blade of grass. I feel Joaquin in every ray of sunshine. I won't ever lose the lessons of love he instilled in my being. I thank Joaquin every single day for being himself and giving others the space and permission to be themselves. Joaquin is love. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Mrs. Kelly Petty. And Megan Petty. Okay. Ladies, would you both please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, and ma'am, would you please state your full name <clears throat> and spell your last name for the record? Kelly Petty, P E T T Y. And Miss, if you would please uh, do the same. 
Megan Petty, P T T Y. You, you can both have a seat. Who's ever going to speak first? You should, I guess, sit in the chair closest to me, just because that's what I told you. That would be Miss, Mrs. Petty. Will be speaking first. It, it actually doesn't matter where you sit. I'm just trying to give you some guidance there. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Petty. Are you the mother of Elena Petty? Yes. May I approach the witness room? Sure. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 34. This is your daughter, Elaine. Yes. Will you please show the jury the photograph? Mrs. Petty, did you prepare a statement that you can share with the jury today? Yes. Okay. Could you read it for us, please? Okay. On February 14th, 2018, my heart stopped beating. <laughs> Our fourth and youngest child, Elena Petty, was taken back home to live with our Heavenly Father. <laughs> Elena was born in Seattle, Washington, in the Seattle, Washington area on August 22nd, 2003. She was the cutest little baby and was different from her older sister and the fact that she had brown hair and beautiful dark brown eyes. Elena was definitely a mama's girl. She would always cling to me as a baby. My family members would say she looked like a little monkey because she always had her arms around my neck and she would grab onto my hair with both of her little hands. I never minded it, though, because she was my little buddy. Elena loved doing things with me. She started cooking with me in the kitchen at about three years old. She loved helping me, and even when she was a teenager, she would walk through the kitchen and stop at the stove to stir whatever I was making for dinner. I remember one time when Elena was about 12 years old, I was cutting something up for dinner and I accidentally cut my finger. I must have said ouch or something because Elena asked if I was okay. And then she came over and got a band-aid out and fixed my finger for me. She was very sweet in that way and was always willing to help someone in need, especially her clumsy mom. Elena had a lot of wonderful friends and loved doing things with them. One of her favorite things to do was stay at home and be with her family. She was kind of a homebody. My husband traveled a lot when our kids were little and it took a few years for Elena to warm up to her dad. When she was about three years old, she started loving being with her dad and thought he was the funniest guy around. When Elena was little, I remember that she loved her big brother, Ian. There's eight years difference between them, but they would lay together on the floor and watch a TV show together. It was very sweet seeing how they were together. Elena also loved her big sister, Megan. Elena wanted to do everything her big sister did, including wearing her clothes, which could be a source of contention sometimes. Megan told Elena that if she would ask before she took her clothes, she would be okay with sharing them. Elena always made sure to ask Megan before she borrowed anything again. <clears throat> she looked up to Megan and tried to respect her wishes. Megan is five years older than Elena, and as they got older, they would watch the same TV shows and snuggle on the couch together. I love how much they actually liked each other and wanted to spend time together. Patrick is Elena's second big brother and is about three years older than her. They had a rocky relationship for quite a while. Patrick, being the awesome big brother that he was, also enjoyed 
teasing Elena a little more than he probably should have. Elena was a bit feisty at times and didn't always respond to the teasing in the most appropriate ways. Patrick could definitely push her buttons. I remember one afternoon when Elena was about 12 or 13 years old, she and Patrick had just come home from school and she was telling me about something that had happened that day. Patrick made a comment and was teasing her again. Elena just looked at Patrick, rolled her eyes, and said, ha ha, very funny. I was completely shocked and floored at her reaction. I told her that I was proud of her for not getting mad at Patrick and that she reacted in the perfect way to his comment. That was the day their relationship changed. They actually started to become friends. I know that Elena looked up to Patrick when she was in the eighth grade and choosing her high school courses. She wanted to sign up for JROTC just like Patrick had. I was really surprised at that because she had never expressed interest in anything like that at all. JROTC was probably one of her favorite classes in her short time at high school. She made a lot of great friends and thoroughly enjoyed all the extracurricular activities associated with that class. Elena was also involved with our church. We are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As a church, we are encouraged to do service for our neighbors in the community. After Hurricane Irma, many members of our church went to Everglades City to help clean up their homes that had been filled with mud and debris. Elena went with her dad one weekend to help and loved being able to serve others and spend time with her friends. Elena was a really good and loving person. She loved her friends, she loved her family, and most importantly, she loved God. I am heartbroken that I won't be able to watch her become the amazing young woman she was turning into. But in my grief, I know that Elena is with our Heavenly Father right now, and I know that I will see her again in the next life because we are an eternal family. Thank you for taking time to listen to a grieving mother. Thank you, Mrs. Betty. Good afternoon, Megan. Good afternoon. Megan, are you the sister of Elaine Petty? I am. And did you prepare a statement for I the did. court today? I did. Can you please read it to us? Yes. My name is Megan Petty. I'm Elena Petty's older sister, and she was murdered in classroom 1216 on February 14, 2018. Today, I will attempt to share with the court at least a small portion of how my family has been impacted by her murder. But as a disclaimer, I don't think the words exist to adequately describe the depth of pain, confusion, and anger that we deal with every single day. Elena was 14 years old when she died. She went to school that day in her uniform for JROTC, which was a school program she loved. She was in her final class of the day when she died. I'd like to talk a little bit about who she was. I am five years her senior, but in many ways, she was more grown up than I, sorry, I feel I ever will be. She's very smart extremely confident, and she shined with integrity, which is a challenge, especially at that age. She was so generous and always willing to help out a friend, an outcast, or whoever she saw that was in need. I would have loved to see her grow up 
because I know that she would have been a blessing to the world. What I, look, I most looked up to her for was her heart. She loves her friends and her family so much, and she expressed it in a way beyond her years, as she would tell you exactly how she felt about what you were doing and whether she thought it was wrong or right, and somehow found the words at the tender age of 14 to do it in a way that showed she loved you and really cared about your choices because they would affect your future. I aspire to have that much pure love for others and the confidence to stick up for my beliefs no matter what someday to be just like her. I try my hardest, but her loss makes me feel empty. And like truly loving anyone ever again is impossible. She was an angel on earth, and she should still be here. And this world has been robbed of a beautiful soul. Fourteen is too young to die. It causes me pain to know that she never got a chance to even truly live. She never got her braces off. She never had her first kiss. It causes me pain to know that she never went on a first date or felt the nerves and excitement associated with that uncharted territory. And it hurts me to know that she never got asked to the prom. It causes me pain to know that she never got to fall in love. She never got to experience heartbreak and come out stronger and wiser. It causes me pain to know that she'll never go, go get her driver's license. She'll never feel the satisfaction of getting her first paycheck at a job. She didn't get to pick what college she wanted to attend or feel the anticipation of waiting for that acceptance or rejection letter. It causes me pain to know that she'll never get married or be able to have kids of her own. And she probably hadn't even begun to think about those things because she was supposed to have a lifetime to figure that out. On Christmas in 2017, two short months before her murder, we found out that my sister-in-law was pregnant. Elena was so excited to be an aunt, and it hurts our whole family to know that she never got to meet my nephew. She didn't even get to see an ultrasound. She missed his birth, and she's missed the birth of my second nephew. They're now two and four, and someday we're going to have to explain to them why they have two aunts, but I'm the only one here. Elena's death has left a hole in our family that was created before they were born, and this will affect us all forever, even if some of us weren't alive to feel the initial loss. How her death has impacted myself or our family is an unfair question. How am I supposed to explain that? It affects us all constantly, and in a way, I don't even notice as I struggle to survive every day since February 14th. My parents are now empty nesters. They were supposed to have more years with the child at home, and they didn't get that. As much as they love myself and my, my two brothers, that aching void can't be filled by us. Instead of Elena getting her diploma, smiling for a picture, and feeling accomplished, my parents walked across the stage to get a box with an empty cap and an empty gown and an honorary degree that she should have had the opportunity to earn herself. They lost their baby and no one and nothing can replace a child. I can't fix that pain for them, and it would be equivalent to insanity to even try, and it's hard to see them suffer and know that I can't fix it. I've always considered myself to be a strong person, but I quickly found out that this was not the case. No amount of strength can prepare you for hours of waiting and worrying, only seeing to, your to see your parents come home with one of your siblings, but not the other one. They never deserved to be put in that situation, and both Patrick and Elena deserved to walk back home through the door of our house that night. The fact that they did not come home together has affected me profoundly. I spent that time... I waited at home praying she was just injured. Even if she was really hurt, she would still be alive. I lowered my expectations to the lowest that I could handle in that moment, and it still wasn't enough. To say I was shattered would be an understatement. 
And the initial pain of finding out she was dead has been nothing compared to the pain of living without her. I keep waiting for her to walk through the door, even though we've moved houses, even though it's been four years, even though part of me knows she's not coming back, although the rest of me can't handle admitting that yet. I am still holding out the hope that this is all a nightmare or some horrible joke, that I'll wake up and she's back in our arms safe and sound, and this will all fade away instead of the reality of her death creeping up on me more and more each day. Her absence screams at me, even when I'm focused on other things, knowing she is dead looms in the back of my mind at all times and in all places and with all people. The fact that she's dead is something that my mind can briefly acknowledge, but I will never understand why she is dead, so I try to just shut it out. Because I cannot emotionally comprehend that she is gone completely from this world. Four years has not been long enough. 40 years will not be long enough, and 400 years would not be long enough. All I have left of her are pictures, videos, and texts. I reread them, and every time I do, I feel her presence and the life behind them disappear a little more. I should be making new memories with her, not begging her friends for stories about the things she did or said in the past. Even if she had gone to Mars, she would be closer than she is now. I have a really hard time thinking about her. She's my sister, and thinking of a family member that I love hurts me. I unconsciously avoid it. I dreamed of her twice in four years, and I didn't see her face in those dreams because my brain, even while asleep, knew that I'd be in too much pain. I can't hear her voice when I think of her anymore. I don't remember what it felt like to hug her play with her, or even fight with her. I look at pictures of us together, and it feels like the two people in those photos are strangers. I know that as my life continues on, I'll remember her less and less instead of creating more memories with her and becoming closer. She used to sit on me when I laid on the couch trying to crush me, even though she was too skinny to make it even hard for me to breathe. I remember how warm I would get with her sitting on me, and I used to tell her that she was a great heated blanket. She was alive, warm, and present. Every time I think of her, I shouldn't have to cry and call out to this guy, hoping for evil, even a twinkle of confirmation that she still exists out there somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porter. You already had it before I said it. Sorry. Sorry. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. And when you're seated, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Linda Beagle Shulman, B E I G E L S C H U L M A N. Good afternoon, Ms. Shulman. Good afternoon. Are you the mother of Scott Beagle? I am. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? I'm going to show you what's in the States Exhibit 71. Is this a picture of your son? It is. Can you show the jury, please? Ms. Shulman, did you prepare a statement for the court today? I did. Can you please share it with us? Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my son, Scott J. Beagle. It's been 1,630 days since I last spoke to my son. 
On February 14, 2018, my life was shattered forever. I have a box over my heart with a lid so tightly closed, trying to keep all my emotions under control, but today I'm taking the lid off that box. Scott had such an impact on so many people. I'm not sure where to begin. So please bear with me as I share with you a little about my son, Scott. Scott and I had an amazing mother-son bond that cannot really be put into words. I spoke with Scott almost every day. The conversations could be just 30 second touch, hi mom, can't talk but just making sure you're okay, or a five minute conversation, mom, I gotta tell you about our cross country meet today, or I have a great idea for a lesson plan I wanna run by you. Scott was my go-to person. No matter what the issue, we had an unspoken understanding that we could vent to each other, not be judgmental, give advice only if asked, and never ever get it thrown back in our face. Needless to say, we did that quite often. If I couldn't remember a title of a movie, I called Scott. If I forgot who wrote a song or, who was, or sang the song, I called Scott. If I wanted to know the best exercise to work on any part of my body, I called Scott. Scott was very humble and very private. He had a dry sense of humor coupled with sarcasm and an extremely quick wit. Scott would tell you a story and you would walk away scratching your head wondering if he was pulling your leg or being serious. Scott went to summer sleepaway camp for the first time when he was seven years old. He looked forward to his summers at camp year after year. He actually went into teaching so he could continue going to camp. Scott went to camp until he was 35 years old. He went from being the youngest camper to running the boys' side of camp. Scott was a champion of the underdog. One year at sleepaway camp, one of his new campers was feeling left out and a bit homesick. Apparently, this camper was not part of the more athletic boys' group and seemed out of place. Scott observed the camper, took him aside, and asked him what was bothering him and how they could fix the problem. The camper explained that he was not so good in sports and felt quite sad. After finding out that the camper loved theater and the arts, Scott got him involved in the camp's next theater production. At the end of camp, when the awards were given out, this camper got the trophy for most improved theater crew and continued to go back to camp year after year. Scott's love for camp transitioned into his love for children, whether teaching or coaching. Scott spent time volunteer teaching in South Africa. He left home with two suitcases and came back with one. I, of course, thought the airlines lost his luggage. He explained to me that the children here in the USA worry about having the newest style of Nikes, where the children he taught in South Africa were happy just to have shoes on their feet. He said he left his suitcases because the children needed his clothes and belongings way more than he did. Scott loved him at his MSD cross-country team. When Scott was offered the teaching position at MSD, they asked him if he would co coach cross-country. Scott said, sure, what, that would be great. When he called me to share his good news about getting the teaching position, he said, by the way, I also got the cross-country coaching position. I hesitated a moment and asked him, what do you know about cross-country coaching? His answer was nothing, but if I said no, I might not have gotten the, co the teaching position. On the first day of coaching, he came clean and told his team, I have never cross coached cross-country, but if you teach me about coaching cross-country, I will teach you about life. Scott's cross-country team loved him as he loved each and every one of them. To this day, I still hear from them I still hear from many of them on the team. Scott treated all the members of his team equally. It did not matter if you were the fastest runner or the slowest runner. He never pointed fingers or placed blame on anyone. Here's a perfect example. After his team missed placing in the state championship by only a few points, the team went over to Scott and asked, Coach, what can we do better next time? Scott, in his typical non-judgmental way, answered them all, just run faster. To this day, Just Run Faster is the MSD cross-country team's motto. 
Scott treated people as he wanted to be treated and taught his students that he would have liked to be taught. Scott did not believe in teaching straight out of the textbook. Teaching by experience was more his style. I am not the only one who misses Scott terribly. Scott's grandmother, my mom, still tears up when his name is mentioned. The two of them had a very special bond. After Scott's grandpa died, his grandma always had the security of knowing Scott was only 40 minutes away if she ever needed him. Scott loved his grandmother and would move heaven and earth for her. That all ended on February 14, 2018. Scott was the safety net she always counted on. Scott's Sunday brunches with his grandma were the highlight of her week. She continues to have a real emptiness without her grandson. Scott loved being an uncle while Remy and Dylan definitely reaped all of the benefits. Scott would get on the floor down to their level and play with them for hours until they got tired. Remy and Dylan still talk about their uncle Scotty. What a tremendous loss for them. Scott was the magical uncle in their lives. They would see Scott and their eyes would light up. Remy, Scott's seven-year-old nephew, and Dylan, his five-year-old niece, now look up, look up in the sky for their Uncle Scotty star. Scott will always and forever be their amazing Uncle Scotty. Let me share with you about Scott's sister, Melissa, who is still having difficulty coping with the loss of her brother. At least once a day, she has a Scott moment where she is overcome with emotion and sadness. Even with all the sibling, sibling, sorry, sibling rivalry between the two of them, she truly loved her brother more than he'll ever know. Scott impacted people all over the world. Since his murder, I have heard from hundreds, if not thousands of people from all over the United States and the rest of the world, as far away as Australia, Germany, England, Canada, and South Korea. Whether by text, email, or letters, they have expressed their sense of loss and grief. I only wish Scott would have known how much of a difference he made in so many lives. I miss my son today. I will miss my son tomorrow. I will miss my son for the rest of my life. I'm still trying to learn to live with this every day and is not getting any easier. I will never get over it. I will never get past it. My life will never ever be the same. Thank you, Mr. Schulman. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank, Thank you, sir. You can be seated. When you're seated, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Michael Shulman, S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N. Good afternoon, Mr. Shulman. Good afternoon. You're the father of Mr. Scott Beagle? Yes, I am. And have you prepared a statement to share with the court today? Yes, I have. Can you please read it? Sure. Let me tell you about my relationship with Scott. Scott had a very dry, witty, sarcastic sense of humor. When I decided to ask Linda to marry me, I knew that I wanted to get Scott and Melissa's from approval. I was not worried about speaking to either one of them, but I was a bit nervous since I did not know what they would say and how they would react. Scott looked me straight in the eye and said, All I ask is that you make my mother happy. That was the easy part. After Linda and I got married, I decided that I wanted to, to adopt Scott and Melissa. I wanted them to, have, to be their dad and not their stepdad. 
Both of them were adults and both agreed without hesitation. It's a little unusual for someone to adopt a child in the mid-twenties. Part of the process is to go before a judge in chambers for a private discussion. The judge asked both Melissa and Scott why they had agreed to allow me to adopt them. Melissa said all the right things. Then the judge turned to Scott. He looked at me, he looked at Linda, and he looked at the judge and said the most deadpan expression, I don't know, I had nothing else to do this morning, so I figured, why not? I maybe I could get lunch out of it. That was Scott's humor. That was my son, Scott. You never quite knew what he was going to say at any given moment. He managed to always keep me on my toes. Scott loved baseball, and he wanted so badly to learn how to throw a curveball. In my high school days and college life, I was a catcher. Scott would walk off the appropriate 60 feet, 6 inches, and we put a seat cushion down on the ground at, at home plate. I tried to show him how to throw, break off a curveball. We did it for days. Finally, one afternoon, he threw a most incredible curveball, and the look on his face was priceless. The smile was as broad as could be possible. Scott was proud of Scott. Scott and Linda are New York Yankee fans. I am a New York Mets fan. Even though Scott was a lifelong Yankee fan, he made a point of making sure we went to at least one Mets game a season. The last game we went to was in 2017. I really miss those games. I really miss a catch with my son. Scott, in his own way, was an incredible person. He would give you the shirt off his back, even if he wasn't wearing a shirt. He was loyal to his friends and family. He would ask, if you asked Scott for some help, he was there before you finished the sentence. He would do anything for his friends and family, and those friends included his campers, his students, and the members of his cross country team. On the contrary, he hated to ask for help. He felt he was imposing on people. I remember when he decided to move to Florida. Scott and his mom found an apartment to rent. The apartment was nothing fancy and needed some work. I asked Scott what I could do to help. The next few weeks, I flew down and we painted, hung pictures, and installed seal ceiling and wall fixtures and built furniture. It was one of the most fondest memories I have of Scott and I working together, father and son, getting him set up for his new life in Florida. On February 13, 2018, the day before Scott was taken from us, I was homesick with the flu. Scott and I did not speak every day, but this day he called to see how I was feeling. I remember telling him pretty crappy. We spoke for a few moments and he said, I'll call you, call you and check in on you tomorrow. That call never happened. Each time I walk by Scott's room in our home in New York, I think of Scott and what should have been. It caused me pain to know Scott's experiences and memories I will never have. I would have stood next to him as he got married. I would have been with Scott when he became a dad. And Scott and I would have held each other and shed tears of joy instead of now shedding tears of heartache. On February 14, 2018, my entire life was put into a blender. My life was turned upside down and inside out. Each day, and some, some thought or oh, memory of Scott comes to mind. I try desperately to hold on to those memories because of all I have left. There will be no more new memories. I will never go to another ball game with Scott. I will never help him set up another home. I will never get one of those goofy cards for my birthday or one of those sarcastic phone calls. I will never pick up, pick our brackets for March Madness together. There will be no more new memories. I miss you, son. I will miss you forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. No other witnesses, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes the uh, that concludes our day. But before you leave, I, I have to remind you of two things. First of all, tomorrow, 
Um, we are going to start at 10 a.m. I had indicated previously 9 a.m. We have a 10 a.m. for you all to be here. Um, I have a, another matter on an uh, unrelated case that I have to take care of in the morning, so we're going to go ahead and, and start at 10. Uh, on Thursday, which is the 4th of August, I indicated a half day, and that is partly true. We're likely going to go into about 2 or 3 o'clock, um, so it's not quite a half day, it's more like a three-quarter day. So if you would just note that on your schedule that Thursday, it, it will be an early day, but not quite a noon uh, finish time. We anticipate going until about two, between 2 and 3 on Thursday. Um, other than that, I don't think there's any other announcements. Um, please leave your notepads <coughs> behind. Please remember the instruction that you are not permitted to discuss the case uh, with anyone, including your friends and family members, uh, while on a recess. Please be vigilant. Uh, do not let anyone approach you or speak to you about the case. And if someone does try to approach you to speak to you about the case, please walk away and please report the, the incident immediately to uh, my office. Other than that, uh, please have a safe drive home, and I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you. <coughs> In recess for the evening. Yeah. Yes. I just have one other thing. Um, uh, I just wanted to advise the board that one of the team members of the guys before we did the statement was in the elevator with one of the victim's girlfriends. There was no conversation. I don't even know if that person knew the team member, but it's the, the <coughs> well, Keen Oliver's girlfriend was in the elevator with a defense team member. Okay, well, I, I assume you all didn't have any discussion, and... That's correct. And I... Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so tomorrow, uh, you will keep in mind that uh, I'm going to be unavailable until uh, we're going to try to start at... I asked the jurors to be back at 10. We'll aim for a, a 10.30 start time, so if you all can be here at 10.15. Other than that, I don't think there was any, was there any uh, state, I don't believe there was any evidence that was shown. There was, Your Honor, and I'll give it to the court now. I meant that the media, that the public didn't get to see, that the media would need to see after after we recess. Yeah, there's uh, uh, medical data. That's right, that's right, okay. And uh, the, uh, drug searches and that was public, yeah. So the only that wasn't published is the um, photos that went that coincided with the medical examiner's testimony that was this morning. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're in recess until tomorrow at ten fifteen, and um, the members of the media who are going to view the evidence, if you would please uh, wait behind while everyone exits, and we'll have you go ahead and sign in as we have uh, on the other days. <coughs> 